I'll call the meeting to order. It's 11 past seven, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. O'Leary, Mrs. Gonzalez, Mr. Walner, and Mr. Studo, and we're going to begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And our first order of business will be public comment. So if anyone would like to provide public comment, please raise your hand or note in the chat room. Most everybody is joining us by, looks like they can raise their hand. And I see, I see none. I do not see any hands up, Madam Chair. Right. No chat, no hands. So we will move on to uh, the next order of business, which is to designate the position of Economic Development Committee member as a special municipal employee. And I guess we can go to Mr. Gilberto or, or Mr. Studo, which uh, whoever would like to. Madam Chair, I'll give a brief introduction and Mr. Studo can fill in as necessary. Sure. Uh, you should have seen a, um, an, an email from uh, the town planner who jo who's joining us this evening sent on behalf of the Economic Development Committee um, requesting consideration to designate the members of the Economic Development Committee as special municipal employees. And uh, my understanding is that uh, the reason for this is that they are looking to host a business to business type event that I'll ask Mr. Studo to elaborate on if uh, he is so willing. Uh, but they're looking to do so at an outdoor venue where they can offer some food and, um, and um, beverages and um, have identified a location um, I think as folks know, the number of locations that would fit that venue here in North Reading are fairly limited. And uh, the location that I, I know the, that some of the members are looking at is owned by a member of the Economic Development Committee. And so in order to be able to lawfully enter into an agreement to um, contract with that entity, um, the members would need to be designated special municipal uh, employees. So that was sort of a quick explanation, but I will defer to Mr. Sudo um, or to Mr. O'Neill, who I also know is, is here and is the chair of the uh, committee. Oh, great. Great. Mr. O'Neill, anything to add to that? No, Mr. Gilberto is doing a fine job. Uh, Vinny might have some more he wants to talk about. All right. Vin Actually, Mr. Studo. since we're playing past the buck, it is uh, <laughs> Ms. Egan from the Chamber of Commerce actually has the pertinent information for the, uh, for the board uh, on this. So thank you for the introduction from... Uh, Mike, but uh, I can, I'll give it out to Lisa. So this is, this is probably going to be a PSA of your event as well. I think we discussed it at our last board meeting. Mr. Studo mentioned it, but it, it was rather late in the evening. And I think we were the only ones listening to ourselves at that point anyway. So welcome, Ms. Egan. Yes. And, and for those in, in attendance, Ms. Egan runs the North, Reading and North Reading Chamber of Commerce. So welcome. And if you want to give us a little bit more information about it before we take a vote. Of course, thank you so much. And thanks for making time for this on the agenda. I really appreciate it. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting with the Economic Development Committee. We've been meeting more frequently. We have a lot of really great plans. And I think that we agree that there's a lot of desire for people to just connect in a safe way. It's been a long um, year for business owners and residents alike. And the EDC would love to have an annual event as they have the last few years to bring the community together, the business community, um, share some best practices, have the chance for safe in-person networking, as well as the opportunity to connect with people who may have opened businesses recently or they might not know, and to share a little bit about what's going on in town and what progress is being made in terms of sewage and um, Concord Street, et cetera. So we identified a few priorities for having such event. And I think it is in the best interest of public safety to have um, an outdoor venue or a venue that's in a tent. So all of that um, pointed toward one particular venue with the best setup for it. Um, we hope to have it on Tuesday, June 8th before school is out. The weather should be nice and it will be in the evening. Um, after businesses are winding down, probably 5.30 to 7 or so. So just a couple of programming notes for businesses to hear, but really an opportunity for the Economic Development Committee to bring the business community together, 
reconnect, talk about how they got through COVID. And um, I really do think that that venue that we've discussed is best suited. And I realize that there needs to be a special vote in order to um, have there be any perceived conflict of interest. So um, I think that's all the highlights I have, but I do think there's a real desire for people to connect. I see it in my own business where we're planning events and such and hearing and talking to business owners weekly. So I think it would be a wonderful opportunity for the EDC to pull people together and really engender some goodwill and good feeling about the town being supportive of the business community and hearing firsthand as to what we can do as a team and as a town to support them as they come out of the pandemic. Okay. Um, to oh, to my um, colleagues, I believe we had an opinion rendered regarding this, which is why it, it's come up for a vote. Um, and I don't know if there's anything more, Mr. Gilberto, that you want to add to the discussion um, to inform the members as we take a vote on this. Sure. And, and or then I'll turn it to my colleagues to see if they have any questions with regard to this. You're absolutely right, Madam Chair. We consulted with town council as they regularly do when these types of questions come up. And uh, we provided uh, some feedback, which we also put in the meeting packet for the board members this evening. Um, I will just, you know, I'll offer one final note, which is that you know, from my understanding of the discussions regarding the planning for this event and the cost, you know, we would be complying with the procurement law, which allows for um, following sound business practices for any um, contract up to $10,000. And we expect, at least the last that I heard, this would not exceed that amount. So this would not be a situation would be anything, you know, um, a foul of the, the procurement law. We, you know, we, I think the committee by definition has been following sound business practices and trying to identify a location that meets their need um, and, and has settled back at this. So, you know, this would cure any conflict of interest issue. It does not have anything to do with the procurement. That's separately, it would be handled by me. So, but in other words, it's a it's an event that is EDC sponsored and EDC, similar to what they did previously, will be paying the venue. So that's where the conflict of interest arises. So EDC through the committee has chosen the what it believes is the best venue to host this. And and EDC funds, they have a small amount of funds that they they use. And this is a use of some of the funds to promote economic development in our community. So they'll be using a portion of that funds to pay for the event. And that event will invite business owners from our community and from you know, surrounding communities to this, to this venue. And because of the fact that the venue owner also serves on the EDC, that's where ethics issues are involved. Is that it in a nutshell? All correct with the exception of whether the event will go outside the community. That I'm not sure of. I'd have to defer to Mr. Sudo or Mr. Evans. Is it open to similar to your other events, Ms. Egan, to other community businesses, neighboring community businesses? I was envisioning that this would be a North Reading specific event where we'd hear about what's happening in town um, for North Reading businesses only. Okay. Of course, I could easily invite more, but I think that was the goal and the intention, especially since there's EDC town money to be spent um, and we would support it and, you know, invite our North Reading members. Okay. And just for the ed edification of my colleagues, Mr. Gilberto, are we taking a vote to deem anyone who serves in that role? In other words, members of the EDC will be considered special municipal employees. That's correct. It would be every member of the committee. And it, right. it, they've asked for this on a temporary basis. I'm not aware of any such thing as a temporary designation. But what I can tell you is that this, as you know, this board reviews special municipal designation, special municipal employee designations each December. It would review this and we make a separate determination about whether the designation needs to continue or not at that time. Okay, and it and also just one final thing being that just for those in attendance, just like all the other most all the other boards and committees the members of the EDC are unpaid for their service it's a volunteer service on that um, commission so 
Now, let me see if my colleagues have any questions or comments. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, my only uh, comment is that, you know, we should be doling out special employee status on a, on, on a cautionary basis, um, because as was pointed out, this is, uh, you can't do it for one member. It's, it's for the entire uh, commission, which uh, it, again, I don't foresee, I can't see any uh, uh, potential other issues or people looking to contract with the town or get paid by the town for services rendered, uh, but that doesn't preclude it from happening either. So, you know, I would, um, I would encourage us again to, to look at this on a semi-annual or annual basis uh, rather than a carte blanche and, and uh, because uh, there have been problems in the past uh, with this designation. So I would just urge us to be cautious and um, you know, there, there are other venues of people who don't serve on this committee, but uh, I also know that this, this particular venue would work nicely. So, um, so if, if it's our intention to do this uh, on an annual basis, I'll be supportive of it. If we're not, <laughs> but I won't be. Okay. And I, I think to Mr. And to Mr. O'Leary's point, I think, you know, the board, the board could could rescind this just the same as we voted. <clears throat> so we should probably, like Mr. O'Leary said, we we kind of look at these at the end or close to the summertime when we're trying to fill all of those positions that you know we we can't seem to fill. So we're going back to the same drawing, you know, pool of candidates that are around and want to want to work those jobs. Another way to turn up the volume. Okay. Let me see if we have any other questions or comments. Mrs. Gonzalez, any any questions or comments? Um, no questions, just um, in full support of this. It's a, it's a great thing to, to, to do for the community. And um, I'm just fully supportive of it. Mr. Walner, questions, comments? Yeah, um, on June 5th, we're gonna be doing the town meeting and I think it'll probably be handled the same way we handled the previous two meetings, which is, we go through painstaking efforts to keep people apart and you know follow all the protocols. And then three days later, four days later, we'll be doing this event. I don't know, you know, it, you know, is there a maximum amount of people that can come? Has the Board of Health um, input on this? And I just don't know the answer to the question, but I'm just wondering the optics of this coming up so soon after we just have a town meeting where we're putting people through great paces not to violate any CDC rules or people at harm's way. So I'm just asking the general comment to see if that's been thought through. Mr. Studo? I can answer. Um, so Rich, we, we went through this uh, it, in the meeting several times. Part of the reason we picked June is, um, um, you know, if anybody, if it's anybody like me who is reading way more science than I need to daily, you don't have to follow the tea leaves to see where it's headed and how much safer things are happening. But to answer your question, as of right now, the horseshoe could have a hundred people out there in a tent for an event and it's it's allowed. Um, you know, so from a standpoint of like, you know, just so we, we thought of that. And I think that um, it's something where uh, we kind of addressed that too. You may have been in one of the meetings too, Rit, uh, Mr. Walner. Um, but I think it's more of, uh, it's for business owners and the feel is that business owners are going out. And I think that in terms of the town meeting and the optics, I do think, I do think it needs to be separated because I don't think it's the same thing. Uh, town meeting, th this is a very specific event for a very specific group of people that we feel from feedback want to do this where town meeting is a something where we have an obligation to make it as, I don't know, as, uh, as, as for everyone, right? So again, um, you know, no, good question, because we talked about it. But I think at this point, um, it, in the EDC discussions, it was never, because we picked all the way out to June, I think there was a consensus that this, um, you know, that date was going to work. And based on where everything's going, again, I mean, I'm the optimist here, but 
I don't be shocked if the only mandate left in June is an indoor mass mandate, if that. So I would just don't be shocked if you see that soon. So I do think that the June 8 event outside, I, I don't I don't foresee it an issue. But here's what we did say. If for whatever reason the reopening in trade slows, like train, I think we did mention that it's something that you could easily reschedule for safety. So if I don't know if that is something we we definitely said that too. So it's not like, you know, so, and I don't know if Mr. O'Neill wants to add anything as well. Well, Mr. Studo, I think I, I'm, I'm hearing Mr. Walner's question is more pointed to making sure that there, the guidelines are followed, the social distancing mm -hmm. guidelines are followed even in this event. So I, is that a yes or a no, I think? Well, I mean, I can't control two business owners, you know, shaking hands at the horseshoe outside of the tent. Is that a good way to answer it? I mean, I, I, I that's an unanswerable question. I mean, we're going to follow the rules right now state that everybody that we could have this entire I could I could buy a drink for everybody in this meeting outside in the in the state of Massachusetts says it's OK. That's the current rule. So I don't know. Is that following it? I, I don't know. It's a hard I don't know how to answer it. But yes, I mean, whatever the state allows us to do, we'll do, I guess. And right now, this would be allowed. I mean, this would be allowed like tomorrow. Forget about June 8th. Okay, so. I, um, I just want to add in. If I, I know we're kind of veering off the topic, but I think his question related to, mm -hmm. related to complying with, with COVID-19 requirements. Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, I, I just, I, I think we're getting off topic. I mean, what's before the borders? Are we going to designate uh, this group as special employee status mm -hmm. or, or not, you know, as far as any venue or any um, timing of the uh, the event. And, and again, I wholeheartedly endorse the event and then the thought process behind it and um, the rationale for it. And I think it's going to be a very positive um, thing to be sponsoring and going forward with, you know, so as far as the protocols and all the rest, those are going to have to be followed anyway. So I think what's before the board is, are we comfortable in creating the special employee status for this this group, regardless of what the event is going to be or not be. No, agreed, Mr. O'Leary, but it's a pretty <laughs> rational question for Mr. Walner to oh, ask right. when yeah. we're making a vote and encouraging this kind of activity, and we're not even sure if the, the venue is going to be compliant with the requirements. And we, we don't want to compel an outbreak in North Reading right. when we've been but, doing but my expectation is and, My expectation is Mr. O'Leary, Mr. O'Leary, please don't don't talk. Don't talk. I apologize. Don't please don't. We'll do one at a time. I, I'm I'm very good at letting us all talk one at a time. But I I think it's a valid question to, with everything we've been doing as a community and everything we've been doing before <clears throat> to ensure that people are safe. I think it's a valid. It was a valid question. So um, I don't sure. If, not sure if we got an answer to that. And again, if we can redirect ourselves to whether or not we want to um, allow this vote to um, consider all the EDC members as special municipal employees. Is, does anyone else have any questions with regard to that? All set. Oh, Mrs. Gonzalez. I, I just have a comment as um, to the COVID-19 um, question that this event's being held at the Horseshoe. It is um, a restaurant who I have the utmost faith in the owners. They deal with these restrictions on a daily basis. And I have no question that they will make sure everything will be followed. Okay, so if, with no other questions or comments, do we have a motion? Excuse me, are we going to revisit this annually? Do we do the special employee status annually, Michael? If we don't, we should, like Mr. You, Madam Chair, yes, we do, every December. Okay, so for everybody that's designated as a special employee, we revisit, every single one, we revisit it every year. The human, re through you, Madam Chair, the human resources director <laughs> solicits from those who have previously been designated that whether the need is continuing or not, and they want to bring it back to the select board to review about the same time we consider appointments and appointments. Yes. Okay. And my understanding is it's it's position specific, not person specific. Yes. And yes. and so we're not looking at names so much as posts at when we revisit this in the annually. 
Correct. Okay. So do we have a motion? Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to designate the position of Economic Development Committee member as a special municipal employee. Second. Is it members or member? Mem member. So if you're a member of that, you would be one. <clears throat> okay, I see. Second, by, motion by Mr. Studo. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. The motion carries. Our next order of business is the 148 to 150 Park Street development zoning proposal. And we have Mrs. McKnight joining us. We have a, a, our um, chair of our, uh, I believe we have the chair of our zoning here, chair of CPC here, Mr. Gilberto. You wanna do a little, little sure. introduction? Yes, the town planner, Mrs. McKnight, has joined us. Uh, the chair of the planning commission, Mr. Pierce, has also joined us. And I also believe that there are multiple members. I, I see the developer here, Mr. Wheeler, um, as well as multiple members of his uh, development team as well, um, including attorney Latham, who sent us a letter, I believe, you know, last week or the week before, which is in the board's packet, um, sort of following up on the last discussion of this matter, where the zoning article was reviewed. And I, I, my understanding is that the select would want to have a further detailed discussion relative to the particular development proposal at the address in question rather than the zoning itself. Yes. Okay. So um, shall we hear Attorney Latham? Shall we hear from Attorney Latham? And do my colleagues have any questions for Attorney Latham? Good evening, Attorney Latham. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, could I have the opportunity to um, potentially share my screen? That would be great. Yes. Thank you. And Mr. Alberto, can you make? Is, does he have ability to do that? And and if I may, um, so Mr. Mr. Alberto did a great job. Uh, Mr. Wheeler's here. Peter Ogren of Hayes Engineering is here. Uh, Craig Seymour of DRG Advisory Services is here as well. Uh, Mr. Michael Gittin, uh, LSP, is here. Um, my dad showed up to make sure I don't screw up. And um, <laughs> basically, I will share my screen. All right. And if you give me one second, can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why? why? Why senior housing? Because senior housing is, is frankly, a North Reading housing goal. It's, it's listed as one of the overarching housing goals for the town. Um, and likewise, uh, senior housing has been identified in the, um, in the housing production plan as, as a real North Reading, re North Reading need. And obviously these are sections that you don't need me to read them to you, but they basically emphasize the fact that the, North, the portion of the North Reading uh, population that is seniors is increasing dramatically and most of them uh, need to be able to downsize and um, a good number of them also have uh, some significant disabilities. Um, likewise, it's, it's, it's outlining basically in the master deed that there's this public need, it's consistent with the master plan and that literally the, the future of the housing market in North Reading really depends upon um, seniors of North Reading being able to downsize and many of them would like to stay, have the opportunity to stay in town. So the objective of, of the you know, senior housing overlay district is to allow aging residents to have housing opportunities within North Reading so that they can stay in town and provide a range of housing choices within town and provide housing for the benefit of active seniors in order to meet and preserve North Reading's character and diversity. And at the same time, vitalize the historic downtown center. And so basically, I believe you've all seen um, the bylaw. What I basically did here was basically just try to summarize what it is. And so basically it's an overlay. It, it does not pr pr you know, replace the existing underlying zoning district. And the logistically how it would happen is if, if it is approved by town meeting, it would basically be 
uh, somebody submitting uh, an application for site plan review and a special permit from CPC. Attorney, in the Attorney Latham. Yes. I'm going to delve for one moment. I'm getting a bit of feedback that I'm not sure if others can hear. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute all and then ask you to unmute yourself, sir. Thank you. Okay. Can everybody hear me? All right. So basically a senior housing project under the, under the bylaw does not, it does not include assisted living and it does not include nursing homes. And a senior housing overlay district bylaw requires that a project be at least four acres in, in the size of land and be, have at least 250 feet of frontage and be within 250 feet of a public park or public common or public library with the idea being walkability. It requires that handicap access from the project's parking garage to each unit it requires an elevator in all senior, uh, new senior buildings for senior housing. And it requires that there has to be an on-site senior common area amenity. Currently, it requires that there be 15% of the units be affordable in perpetuity and physically located on the premises. So there's no uh, buyouts, there's no swap outs, there's no moving to other portions of, of the town. And the applicant in, in our instance, Mr. Wheeler is actually proposing that all of the affordable units in this particular project would be handicapped or universally designed, um, which addresses a, a significant uh, issue in North Reading because there is a shortage of um, affordable housing that is handicap accessible. Um, it would require that there only that at least one occupant be 55 years old or older and it limits a senior housing project to no more th than 50 units and no more than two bedrooms per unit. And all new senior buildings um, would be no more than 45 feet high and have minimum setbacks, 25 feet for the front lot line, 20 feet for the side and 20 for the rear. And it allows mixed use for in multiple buildings so long as it's compatible and they do not cover more than 40% of the gross site area and they have a minimum open space of 20% of the total site area. And so this plan here is the current proposed location for the senior housing overlay district. Of course, it's an overlay district. So in the future, if the town or, or anybody wanted to, they could try to go through the process and, and expand it if the town thought it was appropriate. Um, this is the current location. And this is basically a plan. It, it consists of three different tax parcels and it's on the property that was historically the uh, McLean uh, wagon manufacturing site. And that just gives you uh, an artist rendering of what it was in 1906. And so with that being said, why, why the historic center? Well, it was identified um, in the master plan that the historic center was really a location where some people thought it would be a good place um, to have senior housing to have clustered and mixed mixed use pocket. And in addition to that, it's obviously close to the senior center. It's close to the emergency services, close to the library. It's, it's close to the town common. It's actually walkable to the sports fields. And that's the key, it's walkable and it's in the center. Um, this is the existing condition of the property. We have the aerial here and it's the property right next to the uh, police and fire department uh, across from the Flint library. And it consists of basically those four buildings you see there in the parking areas that are there, uh, sort of like an arrow. Um, and then of course you have the street view and as part of this project, there would be the preservation of the historic McLean house. And, and Peter Ogren will talk about that more in detail, but the gist of it is, is to put it on a real foundation so that it will last for another two, 300 years at least. And to move it back away from the street to improve site distances. And what we see down below is existing condition with uh, the steel fabrication company. And at this point, if, if I could uh, turn it over to Peter Ogren to discuss the engineering aspect, I'll, I'll mute myself. Um, I'm still gonna share the screen though, cause I guess I'm gonna be running the, the photos. Mr. Mr. Latham, do, do you have the overlay of the proposed development on to this or is, is that what your engineer is going to be showing us that that's what the engineer is going to be showing ma'am okay great thank you thank you uh, thank you chris uh, if you want to go 
Um, basically, I'd like to just familiarize you a little bit more with the with the site itself. Uh, as Chris said, uh, the, the site, it, as you're heading easterly along Park Street, it's immediately after the public services, the fire and police station. And uh, uh, it rests, well, lies behind the uh, historic McLean House. Uh, what you see in this particular slide is uh, in, in uh, brown is the roof of the McLean House. And in white outline is where we intend to move the McLean House. Uh, the reason we're moving it is twofold. It does have a very poor foundation under it. Uh, there's moisture, obviously, in the days this was built, uh, the moisture barriers weren't put in the foundations. And so in order to preserve the sills and everything, it can use a new foundation. And, and when we do it, we'll be moving it back from the street and in an easterly direction. So it will improve not only the site distance from our driveway, but the site distance from the public services uh, building, which has a kind of a limited site distance uh, looking easterly along Park Street as well. Uh, as uh, Chris mentioned, the site is currently occupied by three commercial industrial uses. There's uh, the uh, office building where, where uh, Mr. Wheeler has his offices. There's an automotive use. And then there's a steel uh, company that fabricates steel and, uh, and uh, 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 delivers it in fairly large trucks. Uh, and and uh, as you go down into the site, I think you're probably all familiar with the site as you go along Park Street, but as you go down into the site, the site is uh, largely not vegetated. Uh, on the very easterly side of it, behind the automotive use, is a large parking lot, uh, and with uh, some fairly significant trucks parked in the very back of it. And then the kind of uh, triangular shape that you see in the middle of the site uh, is a large uh, compact gravel area where trucks own, uh, load and unload the uh, steel uh, that's uh, fabricated on the site uh, for, for uh, uh, when, when it's uh, sold and when it's back distributed uh, for uh, the uh, commercial uses that it's, that's made of it. Um, as you go further into the site, there's a fairly significant wetland area and the, and the uh, line that you see on here that's uh, uh, basically the black line uh, demarks the difference between the upland area and the, uh, and the wetland area. And the upland area of this site is pretty consistently over 10 feet above the wetland area. So there's no concern as far as this being in the, in the uh, flooding issue, uh, a flooding issue. And I think you can see from the disturbance that shows on the site, um, there's very limited vegetation between the existing uses and the, uh, and, and the uh, wetland area. Um, again, the white outline that you see here on the left-hand side of it shows the limited amount of surface parking that we have for the proposal. Uh, there's a drop-off area, uh, some surface parking spaces for uh, visitors and, and uh, service vehicles that might come to the site, and then the outline of the building. The building has been specifically designed so that the streetscape is uh, fairly modest and broken up so that it doesn't look like a big building. Um, but the, the uh, grades drop off um, and it houses the parking underneath it uh, for the 50 units that are contained within the building. Uh, and uh, then the bulk of the units, as you can see, uh, uh, rests sort of behind that first streetscape of the building itself. If we could see the next slide. So the proposed conditions, uh, there's been a lot of concern about uh, being uh, on the river or near the river and so forth. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, this slide is designed to show you uh, the resources on the site. Um, uh, starting at the very bottom of the slide, uh, the solid blue line that you see is the edge of the river based on the DEP definition of, of that. And then the next 200 feet, up to the, the dotted and dashed blue line is the uh, what's called the riverfront area, uh, and is a resource in the uh, in the wetlands regulations. Um, we don't propose any activity at all in that that riverfront area. Um, we're, we're we're intending to leave that uh, natural or where uh, it has been already disturbed by prior uses. Um, it will be revegetated. Uh, moving then in a northerly direction up the site, the first uh, uh, solid line that you see there is the edge of the bordering vegetated wetland. 
And above that are the two buffer zones that the North Reading Conservation Commission looks at. The first is a 12 uh, foot no disturb zone. And the second, a 30 foot zone, which is not in their bylaw, but in which they like to see uh, no building construction. So uh, we've been mindful of those when we looked at the, the uh, site plan. Uh, we also uh, have, have limited our activities as far as the actual 100 foot buffer zone, a limit of their jurisdiction is concerned as well. And the last line that you see, the kind of dotted line that runs through the building is the 100 foot buffer zone. And the activities we have in that are minimal. There's two small portions of the building and a small, small portion of our access and parking lot, as I say, most of the uh, parking, the bulk of the parking is below the building underground and you won't see it. There's also been some concern about the soil absorption system and two things, uh, the elder housing has a lower flow uh, than uh, typical housing on a per bedroom basis. And that's by the uh, state sanitary code. So uh, the flow from the uh, projected 50 units all being two bedroom would only be 7,500 gallons. And it's proposed to have the actual soil absorption system. That is the, the, the uh, place where the uh, uh, effluent is reintroduced to the, the groundwater regime uh, completely outside the buffer zone. In fact, uh, as you can see on this chart, um, it varies from uh, about 103 feet off of the wetland area to 150 feet off of the wetland area and occupies the most northerly uh, portion of the site. Uh, so uh, I think that, that in looking at this site and seeing how it might be utilized for this use has been, uh, I think, a, a, a significant concern for uh, what the existing uses are, what the existing disturbed areas are, and what uh, can be done uh, being mindful of the environmental regulations that are in force and effect. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing is that uh, uh, in this particular instance, the developer is the owner of the uh, historic McLean uh, house, and he wanted to incorporate it into the architecture. And so there's been quite a bit of time spent with the various historical committees uh, and other people in the town trying to come up with a streetscape that is mindful of the, the historic nature of the, the center of town um, and also the scale of buildings in the town. And we show you these uh, renderings. Uh, the first one on the top is looking sort of past the library um, toward the McLean house. And what you're gonna see from that streetscape uh, looking uh, from uh, frontally from uh, perspective from the library across Park Street to the site. Uh, the yellow house uh, that you see in the center is part of the, the new construction. Uh, and then the McLean house, the white building is the existing building. Um, so you can see from a scale standpoint, it's, it's uh, um, I think very well done from, from that perspective. And the other perspective that you see is if you were riding uh, along Park Street past the uh, fire station. The entrance to the fire station is the first driveway that you see. Our driveway to the project is the second driveway that you see in this rendering. And you can, you can see that the, the uh, idea was to break it up in, in uh, small facades uh, in order to uh, uh, maintain the sort of uh, uh, historic character of the center and, and uh, yet house a, a, a significant building. I think that includes my portion of the presentation. And I thank you, Selectman, for hearing us this evening. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, uh, if, um, if uh, Craig could possibly come on and briefly talk about financials. Craig Seymour. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. Thank you. Um, I'll be brief uh, in respect for your time. I was asked to look at the fiscal impact that this project will have on the town of North Reading. And fiscal impact is the essentially looking at the tax flows uh, the tax revenues that come off the project, less the municipal service costs in order to provide, continue to provide the level of services that you have in the past. Next slide. From the revenue perspective, we're estimating that the assessed value of this property when fully occupied is gonna be a little over 26 million. And that's gonna generate over $400,000 in annual tax revenues. 
Uh, the, the existing property pays about 32.6. Uh, so netting that out of the uh, property taxes leaves a net of 379,000. Uh, it also is going to generate annual excise taxes um, uh, from the automobiles that are, will be there. It's not a big number, but we estimate that about $37,000. And other revenues from just on a per capita basis from fines, fees, and charges, and so on, adds another 19 for total revenues of $436,000 on an annual basis. And that's in today's dollars. Next one, Chris. The municipal service costs were estimated by looking at both the households the average household uh, costs of supporting uh, households in the community, plus the small number of businesses that are there, and that gets split up between the two types of activities. Uh, for the variable costs, we're looking at a total annual cost of about $2,300 per household uh, in average municipal costs and $185 per employee. We're basing this on the potential for having nine employees uh, at the facility, it's currently five, that's there in uh, Mr. Wheeler's operation. Uh, and that's about $118,000. Does not include education costs because we do not anticipate having any school-aged children. You know, on the outside chance there could be one, they're very rare. And in most of the circumstances I've seen around the Commonwealth, uh, they are e either temporary or they're very rare to begin with, if at all. Lastly, this is a summary. The next uh, slide is a summary of these two which shows that this has a, a net fiscal impact, positive fiscal impact of over $300,000 into the town coffers a year as a cost benefit ratio of 2.7. And in addition, there's gonna be one-time revenues uh, for building fees and connection fees. Now, obviously those go to the departments that are gonna be doing that work, but they're substantial and uh, well, almost $400,000 a year between the two of them, which obviously helps offset some of the costs that those budget items or those departments may have. So that's uh, the that last thing is kind of the intangible benefits to the community. Um, while it's under construction, a lot of the construction workers may be spending money in, uh, in the community for lunch, dinner, whatever it might be. Uh, household spending typically averages $35,000 to $40,000 per year on select categories like restaurants, food out, food and beverage, health personal items, things that are available uh, within North Reading itself. And in this, this uh, project is going to generate well over half a million dollars a year in that level of retail spending. Now, it's not all going to be spent downtown. It's not all going to be spent in North Reading, but a good portion of it will because the whole idea with the walkability of this community is people can walk up the street to get their coffee. They can walk to the store uh, and they can walk to do a lot of other activities and spend some of that money. And as a result of that, it's going to add more vitality to the town center and just bring and keep, hopefully keep uh, people who are you know, who are residents now, give them an opportunity, as, as Attorney Lantham mentioned earlier, to stay in town and continue to contribute to the community. Okay. Thank That's you, Mr. Attorney Latham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I would also like to note that, that Mr. Mark Hall is here today from the Historic District Commission, but before, um, if you want him to speak, uh, we request that the select board support the overlay district and if, if the board members don't support it, we request that you give us some positive feedback as to how you think we can improve this project and, and what your issues are. We, we greatly appreciate it. And thank, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. We'll take questions in a minute. Just wanna see if Mr. Hall wants to add anything. And I'm assuming, I believe you already told us at our last meeting, you had already had meet and you said it again, you've had meetings with the historic commission, but Mr. Hall, any other comment that you might wanna in part, I can't see him, but I can see he's here. No? All right, let's go to my colleagues. Mr. O'Leary, you're muted. I'm muted, yeah. Uh, just in the, in the bylaw, it stipulates that um, one occupant has to be 55 years or older. And I, and I know that some of the other uh, homeowner associations and, and community of 55 and older have it in their um, bylaws, I guess, in, in their deeds. You know, what happens to the, uh, if the one that's 55 or older and the other one's younger, uh, is there any way to address or has been contemplated, and maybe this is to the CPC rather than the, uh, the developer here, um, you know, if the 55 year old person or older um, passes away or has to go to a nursing home, are they other, is the other occupant forced to sell? 
I'm just curious, and I don't know how other well communities uh, have handled that. Attorney Lane, sure, if I may, please. Thank you. Um, in in the proposed uh, bylaw in section 200-165, in the event of the death of a qualifying occupant of a unit or foreclosure or other involuntary transfer of a unit unit in a senior housing development, a two-year exemption shall be allowed for the transfer um, to, to tr for the transfer of the occupancy of a unit to another eligible household. A senior housing development does and obviously doesn't include nursing home or hospital. The, the reason it was originally drafted with the two year was to not cause an immediate dislocation of the family and hopefully provide more time for the spouse, surviving spouse to maybe reach age of eligibility. But we're totally open to the board's suggestions. And I, I don't know if CPC has any suggestions on that as well. Mr. O'Leary, any other follow up or questions? Uh, just a, a question to uh, maybe Mr. Ogren. What I previously mentioned as far as the uh, access and egress for the public safety facility, I thought there may be an encroachment on, on our part under the property. I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at it and whether there would be a granting of easements uh, to the town. I'm yeah, not... I think th there is a, a little encroachment there, I believe, and it shows on our topo plan. And we had said that we would, we would grant the town an easement. I think that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, I, I, I'm no expert in municipal law, but I think you could do that without a big town meeting action. I think it could just be granted as an easement to the town. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm good for right now. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Gonzalez. Any questions? You're on mute, ma'am. Sorry. Um, just a question about the, you mentioned the affordable units all being handicap accessible. That's not a requirement, correct? Just, they'll just be accessible. Madam Chair, may I respond? Oh, Miss Attorney Latham, yes, please. Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. Um, it, it is basically what's being proposed by uh, Mr. Wheeler. You are absolutely right. It is not written into the uh, bylaw as it's drafted right now, um, but Mr. Wheeler is is agreeable to that. We, we identified when we were reviewing the, the master plan that the town has a serious issue with lack of uh, affordable and disability housing. So that that is something that we think would, would be a benefit to the town and, as well as those particular individuals. Um, and as far as the septic system, um, there's how much, uh, I'm not sure, um, how to ask this question. Um, what is the capability of the septic system and how close to the wetland, how much of an effect will it have? I will defer if I could to Mr. Ogren. Uh, hopefully you can still see the plan that shows a location of where the septic system is. Yeah, the, the, uh, uh, when you say how effective is the septic system, I mean, uh, septic systems have been around a long time and, and uh, there are state regulations as to how close they can, they can be to uh, uh, wetlands and, and to uh, uh, tributaries. In this particular instance, the state requirements would only require the uh, soil absorption system, which is the uh, place where the, the effluent is reintroduced to the groundwater, uh, to be 50 feet from the wetland edge uh, and 100 feet from the, from the river's edge. We're going to be uh, 300 feet from the river's edge, roughly, uh, and 100 feet from the wetland edge. So. We're, we're in excess of the requirements which uh, the uh, state sanitary code uh, has a presumption that says that that provides sufficient treatment if you're the 50 feet and the 100 feet. So we're in excess of that. Now, uh, the, the biggest thing about um, uh, the, the, the nature of effluent when it's reintroduced is that it does, uh, the effluent gets uh, diluted significantly. And in our instance, um, we have only a wetland on the on one border of the property, uh, so that 
the the uh, and, and the it, we have a single direction in which the uh, groundwater likely flows. Uh, groundwater likely flows in the direction of the topography, so that when the soil absorption system is placed where we've indicated it, um, it will have a significant travel time uh, before it ever gets to the river. It'll, it, it travels first of all vertically, and that's one of the reasons I made the point that that almost immediately we're ten feet above the. Uh, uh, the wetland and probably at the site of the soil absorption system where we're uh, uh, 20 feet above the wetland. So it will travel first vertically, which there's a significant die off in bacteria and then horizontally for dilution towards the river. So uh, it, it's far in excess of what's required by uh, the uh, state regulation, which is four feet above the groundwater. And, and as I said, 50 feet to a wetland and 100 feet to the river. And, and what was the capability of it? I'm not sure how what you how you use the word capability. I I, I I mean it's 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 designed to to uh, treat 7,500 gallons a day, which is the expected flow expect, expected peak flow from this facility. Okay. And could it handle more than that if necessary? Um. Uh, yeah, it could, but I mean, the the, the, uh, the sanitary code requirements require certain standards. And in this instance, uh, 150 gallons per unit for a two bedroom unit is considered to be the peak flow for elder housing. So uh, it, it's, it wouldn't fail if you ha had a little extra flow in it from some slug flow or something like that. But uh, you would not be allowed design-wise to have any more units flow into it. So you can't increase the number of units. Okay. Thank you. That answers my question. I'm all set, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. Waller? Um, yeah. Uh, so two things. One is uh, Mark Hall didn't say anything about it, but I do, I'm do. i aware that the HTC has been working very well with this project, and uh, you know, they've they've made some great uh, changes to the outer look of the project to make it more compatible for our downtown. So I appreciate that work that's happened. Um, my concern is, and I heard somebody say, and I was looking at the slide, not looking at the speaker, but um, uh, local preference housing is 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 correct. That is what we want to have happen: is that North Reading residents have the first option to be able to get into these units, and um, and I, I've read, it was section D somewhere, I read yesterday that it's in there, but can you be very specific for all of us about exactly how that will be implemented and how that will be enacted so that the, the, the North Reading residents have first options to be able to get into these units, either at the onset or even as they turn over, how that will work. So if someone can answer that question, please, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yes, there is a, a preference for North Reading residents is listed in the bylaw and the bylaw itself has been drafted. So it's in uh, definitions uh, are under state law and federal law and the Commonwealth smart growth. We also use um, many of the state's uh, models for um, inclusionary uh, housing and things like that. Um, so for the affordables, basically there's going to be um, a lottery. And one of the, in the lottery process, the preference would be one of the elements. So they're, they're obviously, as part of the lottery process for the affordable housing, there'd be a preference towards North Reading um, residents. Okay, and what about the other units? So that's 15 of the 50 units. What about the other 35? Um, we're open to suggestions. I mean, the, the other units, obviously there's, there's eight under this proposal that would be uh, affordable units. Oh, In terms yeah. of the other units, um, they're obviously going to be market rate, and um, our objective is to have it primarily be for North Reading residents, um, but it, it is going to be market dictated. So, um, but if you have any suggestions, we're more than open to them. Well, I mean, I think the suggestion is to allow some reasonable time for um, first applicants to be North Reading residents. I mean, I think that would be the most obvious solution to that. I mean, give them, you know, a 60 day window to get in there before it gets advertised outside of the community. Cause I think that's the, that's the, 
if we're going to succeed in doing local preference, that's what it's about, right? Just give people a chance to get in there. Um, so, I mean, I'm not an expert in this thing, and I don't know what other communities that have done, but I would like to see something like that built into the uh, rules or bylaws or however you're going to put it, so that way we allow that to actually happen. Thank you. Thank you. I took notes. Thank you, Mr. Ron. Mr. Studo. I'm all set. Thank you. I did have a, a just a couple of questions with regard to this slide that we're looking at. It's probably maybe for you, Attorney Latham. So this slide that we're looking at, the Ipswich River is in the darker green portion on the uh, to the south of the proposed, right? We so can't his, see it in sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. So, so basically, the the bank of the Ipswich River, and and I'll defer to Peter Ogren who composed this plan, but the bank of the Ipswich River is actually the dark blue line at the very bottom of the image. That's that's correct. So that that's the bank. That's the outer bank um, from which the measuring point is for the the state um, river protection act. So the, the, the State River Protection Act has two zones. It has a 100 foot and then it has a 200 foot. And the second blue line is the 200 foot under the, the Massachusetts River Protection Act. So that, that whole 200 feet is referred to as the riverfront area. So it's the edge of the river is the solid blue and up to the dotted blue line is the 200 foot riverfront area. So if I'm looking at this, is, this is, we're looking at a bird's eye view of this and that T-shaped building is what's being proposed here with the 50 units, right? I mean, in the lighter green area, there's a T-shaped building. Yes, that's right. correct. But that's that correct. is actually being built, you know, almost into that area to the south, to the uh, southeasterly corner here. So. What, what you can see from this overlay is the, the, the shed building, which is I think that long rectangular building in the middle, sort of in the middle at the, at the yeah, that, that's, that's, that's better, that's a better image, I think. So this would be built, see, so that T-shaped um, or sideways T-shaped is where you're proposing to build this, but it comes, it comes right up almost onto that river bank. It looks like in the pictures that we received. So if, it, if you look at the picture that not only the police station, but that, that middle shed. So the police station adjacent in that middle shed looks like the river is right behind it. Um, and you can see that from the picture that was included in, the, in your letter. So my concern would be, so that T-shaped building not only is going to be, it's going to expand greatly what's existing there, which is just basically pavement, but you're also proposing to build underneath that parking, underneath that. So you're you know, going, obviously, is that underneath the entire building that you're proposing the parking? Yes, the, the, the parking goes underneath the entire building, but it actually, uh, putting the building there represents an improvement from uh, the, uh, uh, as far as the, uh, any kind of discharge is concerned, because that's either pavement or gravel parking lot that we're building on. And both of those have a high runoff and a high potential for pollution, whereas uh, uh, roof water is presumed to be clean uh, under the Wetlands Act. And so we'll be able to take that water and infiltrate it into the, into the ground and, and uh, it will uh, go back into the river in, in a clean form. It, it's an improvement to have the roof there. Okay. And, and again, the, 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 the dotted line is not the, the, the river itself. The river itself is defined way out 200 feet away. The, uh, the, that dotted line is what they call the riverfront area. And actually, under the state regulations, you can build in that area. You can, you can, uh, uh, you can build in any area that's previously disturbed, and you can do you can disturb ten percent of the riverfront area under the regulation. Okay, but this isn't being built into the riverfront area. 
Not at all. We're not going to touch the not, river. And it, the proposal isn't supposed to be disturbing the, the riverfront area, even by 10%, right? That's correct. And, and furthermore, uh, the buffer zone to the wetland, which goes even further upland, uh, we have an opportunity to restore a, a, a significant portion of that, that uh, uh, kind of triangular shape, that's the only way I know how to describe it, is an earth parking lot, which there's a lot of runoff from. Uh, that that will be able to uh, restore that in the, in the buffer zone by revegetating it. And, and uh, we intend to work with the Conservation Commission to see how that, they'd like that to go but we would think about native plantings and things of that nature. Okay. Um, sort of confirmations that you just gave hold true even with the underground being proposed for this? Yes, the, the, uh, uh, the underground parking, uh, you can't have any runoff discharge from the underground parking. So we, you have to take that, um, uh, effluent and and uh, put it uh, put it in a tank and and pump it away. You can't discharge it. So the underground parking is going to be within the footprint of the building itself, the proposed building itself. That's correct. Okay. And for these fifty units, the apartment units or condominium units? They're condominium. Proposed to be condominium. So they'll all be for sale. Did out. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then my my last question is for the for an, for an overlay district, you can use the zoning that's permitted through the overlay, or you can use the existing. And can you use a combination of both of those? I mean, they're very similar in terms of my read of them, but are you allowed to use both, not just one or the other, but both in terms of this particular proposal. Ma'am, so on this property, the uh, a person would have to choose whether they want to go under the existing bylaw or whether they want to go for the overlay. Okay. They can't. They can't mix and match the underlying bylaw with the overlay. It's either you. You have to choose which one you want to do. So was that the um. So the intent and sort of keeping that other um, business uses available, would there be stores for this or anything like that proposed for the, the residents? Would there be amenities like that that might be built onto this or as part of this? Yeah, ma'am, the bylaw, so in, in terms of what we're currently, the proposal is for mixed use, potentially having mixed use, um, the applicant, is only frankly put in mixed use currently in regards to his own office, which is located in the historic McLean house. It, because the bylaw does have mixed use as something that is potentially uh, allowable in, in the overlay district, um, that would have to be approved, however, uh, by CPC to be something compatible with the senior housing uh, project. Okay, so if it's something that, they, that later on might fit in, it would still have to go back to be reviewed. Yeah, CPC would be the ultimate, they'd be the arbitrator as to what they deem to be compatible with the senior housing. All right. And, and I just have one, 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 more, one more question. Um, the existing businesses on the premises, I mean, you were all here and sat through our back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with regard to a business event that's planned. We, we are trying to encourage business, not lose businesses. What is gonna to happen to those existing businesses that are there already? Um, I don't know if Mr. Uh, Wheeler wants to speak in regards to them, but uh, steel fabrication, um, that's not gonna be compatible. Um, it's not gonna be a mixed use with the existing, you know, or the proposed condition. Um, so that that wouldn't be compatible, um, and and obviously um, the automotive repair wouldn't be compatible either. No, I mean I, that's kind of obvious. So are they being they're going to be told to have to leave. In other words, I, they have I, to leave. I believe that they this are aware of the situation. Yeah, this is Bruce Wheeler. Hi, Mr. Wheeler. 
been uh, we've been neighbors with uh, Cronin Steel for almost two decades. Um, Mike Cronin is planning to retire next year, um, and he's uh, uh, he, he's considering closing down the business or selling the business. Um, but he he's let me know that he's planning on retiring as far as you know timing of you know ending his uh, his lease. Um, uh, he's he's given me notice um, uh, with regard to that. Uh, uh, with regard to lose automotive, um, they're aware of this uh, of, of our plans to uh, develop the property. Uh, they uh, like uh, very much where they are, and it's a it's it's a nice location for them. But uh, they're uh, uh, they're making plans for uh, relocation in the future. Okay, okay. I I think that's all for me. Thank you. Any any of anyone else have any other questions? Madam Ch Madam Chair. Hi, Mr. Hall. How are you? Hi. How are you? Good. You had something you sorry. wanted to add? Yeah, sorry, I was on mute earlier, but uh, right. yeah, I say that I'm the um, chairman of the HDC Historic District Commission, and uh, my group uh, supports this project. We work with the developer, um, met with them three times at least, and uh, worked out uh, some changes that the, the developers agreed to, to do. And we're just waiting for uh, that list to be put in writing so we can vote again on it. We did vote on it verbally. Uh, we just need to have it in writing in the application for the certificate of appropriateness. And we, we, we think that's going to go through very smoothly. But we all, all unanimously are in support of this project uh, and uh, cooperation with the developer has been very, very uh, easy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hall. All right, to, to my colleagues, any other questions? Madam Chair, just, uh, just in relation to the, um, the roof run, runoff again, is, are you putting in a filtration system for the roof runoff or are you just gonna let it uh, run into the natural vegetation? Because I know okay. in some developments, they, you know, they filter it and the, the roof runoff would, would uh, it, it probably would go through uh, some kind of treatment, just uh, uh, settling in a tank uh, or, or a, uh, uh, and, and have a, uh, uh, a trap just in case there's any kind of contamination that gets in there. And I'm not thinking of, I'm thinking of contamination like leaves and sticks and stuff like that. Uh, but then we would infiltrate it into the ground. That's what that's what the DEP wants you to do. The first thing is is to to uh, as long as you don't have a metal roof, you can you can uh, uh, infiltrate roof runoff directly, and that's what we would do. Great, thank you. Okay. Okay, all, all set then. Um, thank you for again coming before us and giving us more information on this, it's quite helpful, I think, to our informing us regarding the proposal. Thank you for um, your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I, is, I don't think it's on for a vote, uh, but we'll be, come, we'll, be we'll be taking a look again at the draft warrant. Uh, so we'll move on to our next order of business, which is to review the updated fiscal year 2022 revenue and expense plan. And there we go. We have, I did see Ms. Rourke is here and Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, through you. We're all muted. So Mr. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you. Um, that's correct. Yes, we are here to provide um, updates for the board um, regarding two components of our annual budget process. The first is an update on the revenue and expense plan to really be to go through the um, plan as it was reviewed with the financial planning team um, on Friday of last week, some members of which are here this evening. And then secondly, to go over some um, the, the resulting recommendations to uh, balance the fiscal year 2022 municipal operating budget. 
And through you, Madam Chair, if it's okay, and if she's ready, I'll turn it over to the Finance Director, Liz Rourke. Hi, Liz. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Ms. Rourke. Liz will do a much better job than I did last time going through the revenue plan. <laughs> no, no. Tonight's presentation is very straightforward and simple. So, you know, you gave a very complex uh, presentation, Michael. Good evening, everybody. Um, if it's okay with you, Madam Chair, may I uh, share my screen? Of course. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So quickly, uh, we only have eight slides, so I will not be long. Um, as the town administrator mentioned, the financial planning team met on Friday morning, last Friday morning, uh, to review the latest and greatest uh, FY22 revenue and expense plan and a few changes have been made to the um, revenue and expense plan and we will also review um, municipal and school budget updates. Under uh, local receipts, uh, we found that we were able to increase the uh, payment in lieu of taxes by $25,000. So we went from having a budgeted number of 300,000 to 325. We also increased municipal Medicaid by $5,000. We went from 30,000 to 35,000. Um, we also, in the past, um, have done the following two items, and this year, again, we find that we need to fund school and municipal uh, retirements with free cash, which decreases fixed costs by 200000 We also will be funding school and municipal capital plan raise and appropriate items each year under the capital um, improvement plan, there is funds set aside for raise and appropriate and that amount is $250,000 and that will be funded with free cash. So instead of capital items being funded with raise and appropriate in the capital warrant article, we will be funding those items with, with free cash. Just a quick budget update. Um, and this was all, uh, you know, noted on our latest and greatest revenue plan with the changes that I just mentioned above. Fixed costs total, um, the municipal available funds total, and the school's um, available funds total, which go towards their each um, municipal and school operating budgets. So we have uh, 22,608,179 uh, in fixed costs, which fixed costs include regional school assessments to uh, general liability insurance to um, non-exempt debt service to health insurance to workers comp. You know, those are various items for um, individuals who are not aware are, you know, um, in tune with what our revenue plan um, encompasses for fixed costs. The municipal revenue that is available is $17,824. Um, and the school revenue that is available is $34,180 um, for a total of $74,613,314. The budget requests um, for the municipal side total $18,077,401. Uh, which leaves a shortfall or a budget gap of 253,000. The school side has a departmental or modified level services uh, budget requests of 34,352,117, leaving a budget shortfall or budget gap of 171,202. Um, for a total school and municipal uh, combined, shortfall of 424384. So a uh, quick 
budget update on on ways uh, to recon uh, re reconcile our budget shortfalls on both the school and municipal side. We are able to pull out uh, one time items and fund those items with free cash. So we are pulling out DPW small capital and funding that with free cash. We are pulling out fire department recruit training overtime. This is a one time um, cost for two new hires uh, due to two potential retirements. And that will be funded with free cash as well. Um, also fund school one-time costs of 75,000 with free cash and school small capital items of $10,000 with free cash. On the municipal side with our new revenue plan that we started probably three years ago now, we now break out some offsets that go directly to the municipal and to the school side. And at the last meeting, um, the trash fee was discussed and the trash fee has increased um, $123,970 over FY21. So uh, the municipal offsets was an increase of $123,970. Uh, there was also a uh, transfer from the Solid Waste Stabilization Fund of 36593 that took place um, with the increase in the trash fee. And we also took a look at the building department and we increased the offset from 104 Lowell Road Revolving Fund over FY21 by $3,000. After going through the, past, the last two slides, you will see that um, the available funds for both the municipal and school side, um, yes, uh, stay the same. However, the items discussed um, that are being funded with free cash, um, reduce the budget requests. Um, and that then leaves a surplus on the municipal side of $10,750 and a uh, short budget shortfall on the school si side of 86,202 for an overall combined shortfall of 75,452. And um, after, discussions at the financial planning team meeting on Friday, uh, the school department feels very confident that they um, will have their budget reconciled uh, and have no, you know, no issue with this, but I will defer to the town administrator if he wants to speak um, at all to this point. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Liz. And that's correct. Um, some of you may know that the school committee has had it, you know, at least one workshop style um, discussion where they've tried to identify areas. And um, you know, what was related to us is that they've identified some areas for savings. They've also identified some areas I believe where um, they're going with very conservative estimates because of the unknowns associated with, with COVID. And so um, I, I don't wanna speak for the school committee, but I can tell you that I think those who were on the virtual meeting with representatives of the school committee I think there was an understanding that um, that we were um, that we were there in terms of being able to reconcile the budget overall between now and May 10th. That they had some steps that they would be looking to take, um, you know, within uh, their operating budget, but that they could um, address that. And uh, I think there was acknowledgement that this was certainly a significant improvement from the situation that they were looking at, um, even you know, 10 days ago in terms of what the budget was looking like. So. You know, I, I didn't want to show that shortfall number as a zero because I, I know there is still some work for the school committee to do, but um, I, we took away from the meeting with them a high level of confidence that they would be able to do that. So you know, I don't want to mislead folks that somehow that there's a significant issue with the school committee budget because I do not believe there is at this time, but I believe you know, out of respect for them that they have some work that they're going to do to finalize. And I believe they're scheduled to do so on Thursday of this week uh, at a continued budget hearing. So thank you, Liz, for the opportunity to add to that. Okay, 
Now we'll go to questions. Um, Mr. O'Leary? Mr. As far as the department had uh, proposals and uh, additional requests that were made, you know, of the board, and we seem to embrace some of them. Um, were there any accommodations for those? And if so, what were they and which ones were not accommodated? Um, Madam Chair, through you, so we have a couple more slides to go through that would take us to that the next portion, the second agenda item, if you will. So we can do that right now, take it together if you'd like, or however you see fit. And then the, the another couple of questions was in relation to the trash fee and the discussion that we had, uh, discussions that we've had, um, there's been no adjustment in relation to uh, the suggestion made by Mr. Larray. And I thought it was pretty uh, legitimate uh, questions that were raised in relation to um, covering some of the municipal costs in the tax rate, additionally in, in the tax rate as opposed to through the user fees. And then um, I'll wait for the rest of the presentation. Maybe I'll have some other questions or maybe they answer my questions. Through you, Madam Chair, we did not deviate from um, the, the previous custom of setting the setting the rate to match the total solid waste expenditures for the fiscal year 22 uh, budget. Um, it is something that we expect to look at along with the recycling committee as we move forward for the FY budget. So we could see that there's some you know, change in that, that that occurs, perhaps either in the rate or in reducing the reliance on stabilization fund. We didn't make an adjustment for FY22, just based on where we're at at, at this stage in the budget game um, and the budget plan, but we, we did we did look to, um, to, we are looking towards that for FY23. And, and just one other question, Madam Chair, through you, just the, um, as far as forecasting, uh, what is the financial planning team through the administration have done as, in relation to forecasting uh, free cash for, not for the upcoming fiscal year in relation to the federal funds that are becoming available to the town? Because I don't see, again, I don't see the expenditures of funds from that source. Um, in this proposal at all. And we're anticipating, I would think a substantial um, amount of money moving forward, which is a good thing because again, we're gonna need it for sure. But again, it's one-time funds. Mm -hmm. through, through you, Madam Chair. Or as, Mr. Gilberto. As, as you, the question of the day, Mr. O'Leary. <laughs> as you and, and Mrs. Gonzalez and uh, Ms. Pearl, and Mr. Kelleher know from your participating in the discussions, you know, we are very well aware of a significant anticipated influx of funding from the federal government to the tune of a pro estimated to be to the tune of $4.5 million available to the town for use for um, very specific purposes over a three to four year period. Um, we, we've got the first, the good news is we got the first wave of guidance from the Treasury Department um, shortly, a short time ago. Um, the bad news is all that it said is make sure that you have a, basically a taxpayer ID number yes. so that you can get the money. system. Right. So, um, so we're waiting, awaiting more guidance, but really the strategy that the finance director and I are, are, are applying to this budget is to recognize that that funding is there, recognize that it is limited in nature, but to utilize funds generated on our own at this, at this stage through conservative budgeting over the past two fiscal years, last fiscal year and this fiscal year, in order to um, stabilize uh, the budget through the one-time cost in the way that the finance director identified. And the reason is because we don't know exactly how we can apply those other funds in future years, but we know that they'll be available to us. So we really tried to use this budget, the FY22 budget, as a bridge to those funds, the first batch of which we expect to, to receive in the coming weeks. Um, and which we will hold in a grant account and finance director can speak more to that for use over those multiple years. But um, we, we tried, we're planning for it and we have a, th we didn't go through the three year plan on here. We have a three year outlay at this point that we're looking at with the financial planning team and we'll probably add a year to that when we roll over to fiscal year 2022 on July 1st. Um, but for now, we're trying to operate and, and recommend a budget to the board that relies on the knowns at this point, which is our own resources at this stage in the game, with the exception of some of the small reimbursements that we know are available from previously distributed grant funding and some of the school grant pro programs that the school was aware of as well. And I'm gonna stop myself um, through you, Madam Chair, to the finance director. Is there anything you wanna to add to that, Liz? Did I, anything I missed on that? 
No. No, I, I believe you, you know, covered it. Um, basically, you know, the money that we receive from the federal government under the ARPA funding uh, will be placed within a grant fund and no appropriation is necessary. Um, so basically we sit and wait uh, for further guidelines really. Um, and then we can, you know, decide at that point on how, how those funds um, should and can and will be spent. Anything else, Mr. Trevlary? Just, just in relation to that, it, it is, so it's going to go into a grant fund and can be utilized by the department through requests through the administration uh, without appropriation from town meeting. And what oversight role will this board play or any, or is there any oversight as far as the expenditures of those funds and how they're gonna be monitored? Madam Chair. Mm. Mr. Gilberto. So I anticipate that, you know, much in the fashion that we have worked with the financial planning team regarding the many COVID related grant funds that have became available over the past 14 to 15 months, um, the same would be true with regard to these larger disbursements, disbursements that we are anticipating. Um, we could expand that to reviewing them with the select board as well on a recurring basis. Um, you know, I, I think a good starting point, uh, uh, honestly, would probably be just to review where we are to date with the previously approved and distributed grant funds as well, because there are a couple of buckets of money that have come both for municipal and school purposes. Um, but I, I would envision us uh, reporting back on that. Um, not just on the past money, but once we know more about the guidelines on the future uh, allocation as well. Yeah, I, I, I for one would like to just uh, see what's, how it's worked thus far and then how we anticipate it um, handling the funds moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Mrs. Gonzalez? I have one question and it was asked of me by someone. If if the finance director could explain free cash. They just don't understand it. And um, asked if I would ask her just to give a simple explanation of what free cash is. Madam Chair, is that okay? Oh yes, Ms. Roth, please. This comes up frequently actually. <laughs> you know, uh, since I've been on the board that that question's asked, so. Many, many of my friends will hear me talking and, you know, I'll say, fund that with free cash and they'll say, uh, we'll just fund it with free cash, free cash, free cash, you know, it's just free cash. So um, it, it's hard to understand. Uh, the terminology is kind of bizarre, uh, but basically it's uh, unexpended fund balance. So it is generated from... Um, excess revenues over budgeted revenues. And it is also generated from um, expenditure turn back. So basically spending less than what was budgeted, um, you know, those type of things generate uh, fund balance. Being careful in your, in get, being, being careful in your financial planning too. Yes, very, uh, we generate free cash, um, through our conservative uh, budgeting processes, you know, both on the revenue side as well as on the expenditure side. So, you know, uh, at the end of the year, we turn back, you know, uh, expense budgets and we also exceed our uh, revenue estimates. So that helps us generate free cash. And then that gets certified by the Department of Revenue annually um uh, after we close the books in uh so the our fiscal year ends june 30th our new year begins july 1st we close the books around august 15th and then we have a submission to the department of revenue and they go through all of our accounts and um they certify our free cash similar um to the enterprise funds where uh, the Department of Revenue certifies uh, enterprise funds, um, you know, excess fund balance as retained earnings. I hope that helps. Thank you. 
Thank you. There's a, there's a finger being waved at us too, and it probably has to do with shoring, shoring up our position for bond eligibility too, which I think is in part based upon how much gets certified in free cash. So we're gonna go to our guru here, Mrs. Hurlbut, who has her hand raised to give us a little bit more of a tutorial on this and you're muted, Abby. Yeah, I know I was muted, but my picture kept flashing behind yours and back and forth, so I was unable to unmute myself. Uh, I would like Elizabeth to address the importance of free cash because, uh, and, and for people to understand that there are many communities that actually budget a percentage above what they think they're going to need uh, to achieve free cash. And uh, that North Reading doesn't have a particular policy of doing this, but by virtue of being conservative, we do end up with free cash. And it's very important because it increases our ability to borrow and it makes us look good financially. I am sure that there are a number of people walking around the streets of our fair village that will say, well, if you've got this money left over, why didn't you just, you know, buy more toys or budget differently, but that's not really the answer. Liz, do you want to give a, a slightly clear explanation of the importance of uh, generating free cash? Through you, Madam Chair, um, the importance of uh, generating free cash uh, is one, as discussed prior to um, Mrs. Herbert spoke, is uh, our bond rating, uh, which we just had reaffirmed um, as, you know, uh, AA2. But um, it's also important for the town to have a, a reserve of free cash. Um, you know, if there was ever an emergency and we couldn't dip into, you know, one of our stabilization funds or something didn't qualify under that. We also use free cash annually to fund various warrant articles as well as capital. Uh, so it is very prudent for communities to generate um, free cash. Now it depends upon the year um, and how things are going budgetarily wise, um, both for revenue and expense and you know how much we will generate, how tight your budget is, um, you know, how conservative you are, they all play roles in, in the amount that you will generate within um, free cash. And in the past few years, we have been very conservative um, and curb spending and um, have generated free cash um, in, in good amounts. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Brock. Mrs. Gonzalez, any other questions? No, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Mr. Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Herbert, again, you're muted. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that a really simple way of looking at this is that if you spend your personal money down to the to the bottom line and you want to go buy a car or you want to re refinance your home or you want to take your mother out for dinner for a special occasion, or you wanna make sure your credit rating is good, you're not gonna be able to do that if you don't have anything in a savings account. So in a very limited way, this is you know, good financial planning so that we don't end up going down the river. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Charlotte. Do we have any more uh, questions, Mrs. Gonzalez, do you have any more questions? No, I don't, thank you. All right, and Mr. Walner? Uh, no questions, thank you. Mr. Studo? No, I'm all set. No? Sorry, no, I'm all set. Okay. Um, and I think, I do think in sort of go to, to sort of uh, follow along or piggyback upon those comments that the things that were proposed to resolve the gap 
by the use of free cash, like Ms. Rook said, aren't it's it's not unusual um, for these sort of one-time uh, expenditures, but we don't want to make a regular habit of using the free cash for our operate our regular operational costs. But the things that that she showed us in this slide are some things that we we do and have in previous budgets um, paid for in uh, the use of free cash. And now I have a more general question too for you, Ms. Rourke, that relates to the budgeting and how we budget for and how the school budgets for its expenditures. And if you could do just a brief summary of how that works and does our board control specifically how the school department appropriates the funds that are budgeted um, in the annual appropriation? So um, to answer your question, Madam Chair, the municipal departments um, annually are, you know, tasked with how to submit their budget requests and they then submit their budget requests to the um, finance office as well, you know, as the town administrator. We, um, as the uh, finance department and the town administrator review the departmental budget requests. And then those departmental budget requests uh, through the department heads are presented to the select board um, in a budget hearing. Uh, in conjunction with the finance committee. And those budgets are, are reviewed uh, thoroughly. And then the town administrator uh, comes in with the um, town administrator's uh, recommended budget for the municipal departments. And then the select board and the finance committee also make their recommendations for the departmental budgets and those are, you know, submitted to town meeting through the omnibus warrant article. The school department um, has a similar process. Um, however, their, you know, uh, departments, division heads, um, super, you know, uh, principals um, are tasked with uh, coming up with budget requests, they submit them to the superintendent as well as the assistant superintendent of finance and business operations. And then those are reviewed um, with the school committee. And they, you know, come up with a recommended budget uh, together. We, um, on the municipal side and as the select board and finance committee, um, you know, you can make your recommendation. However, you don't have the, it's not that you have the final say on, on that recommendation. Um, we each have our own separate processes. Um, I hope that answers your question. Sure, it does. I, I just think that the, in theory, it is, it's accurate that we have the, the power of the purse, so to speak, which is also you know, not ours, ours exclusively, because then it, it has to be approved at the town in the town meeting. Mm -hmm. So in theory, like we've experienced at other town meetings, there could be a motion made to, you know, take a line item out or take a cost out or reduce the school budget by $5 million. If we don't like the philosophy, let's say, of how the school is operating, but mm -hmm. In, in practice and actuality, although you've done a beautiful slideshow that explains how you were able to um, shrink this gap with the school, this is not an overnight or a snap decision. It's the result of multiple rounds of reviews and multiple meetings and multiple individuals who are working on this, not just the financial planning team, but the, but the financial department. So we don't do things again on a whim. We're doing things really conservatively and carefully. And while I appreciate the amazing effort, not just on your part and the TA's part, but also on the schools and the school committee's part, because I, I feel that we, are, we continue to sort of scrape off these things that we need 
not just for us, but for the municipal side. We need, we need positions that we just keep scraping off. And so doesn't the school. And the school has basically in yet another round come back, even though their needs increase over the time, just like our municipal needs increase and our revenue doesn't match that. They, they need positions that they've, they've continued to, to scrape, scrape out of the budget to be able to make the budget uh, balance. Things that they need for special ed, for example and staffing they need for special ed and they need tech staffing and nothing could have highlighted that more than this month. They need nursing staffing for the students. We need a grant writer. We need a, we need a tech person for our web. Right now we have sort of the jack of all trades in Mr. Gilberto that's doing all of these things for us that people that sight unseen people don't even realize. And we keep scraping off those really important things that we need as a town to just shrink the, the deficit. So the idea that we could just say, yeah, we don't like your philosophy. So we're gonna reduce your school budget by $5 million, I think would have such, a, such an incredibly negative ripple effect here that, um, that, that is that's something that I wouldn't personally want to be, seen, to be seen done by either the board or the community, because these are careful, careful decisions that we make over the year, over careful planning with a multiple people taking a look at these things to see how we can make it work. So the my appreciation goes to you, Ms. Rourke, for everything you did and all the hours you've spent to make this work, as well as the financial planning team, Mr. Gilberto, and as well as Mr. Connolly, the superintendent, the school committee, Mr. Buckley, all of the people that are participating in these difficult decisions, but that it's carried us through this time. And, you know, like Mr. Mr. O'Leary mentions, it's gonna carry us through what we don't know. Hopefully it'll carry us through with this careful planning, what the, what the next round of impact might be for us, even with that actual infusion of funds. So I thank you for everything that you've done to help us. Thank you. Okay, so if there's no further, uh, I don't know if there's anything else, Mr. Gilberto, that you want to add to that, but I think one other thing to just answer some of those res Rescue Act questions is that, that we are anticipating guidance within the next 60 days. So perhaps by the time we go to town meeting, we might have some more firm information that we might be able to utilize in this sort of three vague three vague areas that we can use this for um, which are helpful to us certainly um, but hopefully we'll we'll be able to talk about this at some more of our meetings when, when more of that guidance from the treasury arises so yeah that's correct okay all right, so thank you, Ms. Rourke. And why don't we move on to the second part of this, Mr. Gilberto, which is to review um, your recommendations on the departmental budgets. Certainly, so while the finance director is uh, advancing the presentation, uh, uh, to make it very brief, you know, we, we asked departments to really scale back their requests when they submitted them back in November and December. And I think that most of you, you know, saw that through the joint budget hearings with the finance committee in February and March. So different from the past years, there wasn't really a ton you know, to cut without you know, having potential impacts. And we had some, you know, some longstanding positions that we were holding vacant over the course of this current fiscal year that we needed to fund. We had recently added positions that we were not quite able to, to fill that we also needed to fund. So we were really behind the eight ball, so to speak, in terms of the staffing associated with the budget. So this was a very different year than it has been in the past two or three fiscal years. Fortunately, you know, through the steps that we've identified, it will allow us to advance nearly all of the requests that you reviewed um, from the various operating departments. And so um, we have a, you know, a spreadsheet that the finance director has put into the presentation um, that we can go through line by line. But what I'm gonna to try to do is rather, rather than focus on that, is just sort of summarize it and remind folks of what, what we're talking about here, which is 
that we would be restoring a very critical position in, in the treasurer collector's front office. It's one of four positions that are actively involved in um, the assessing and, ta and ta taxing and collection of funds for the town. So uh, a critical resource and a staff that has been um, taxed, particularly in recent months um, as activity is picked back up. Um, so that is really, you know, position number one that will um, be able to be filled. It is not currently filled in this FY21 budget. The second is the uh, grant writing and project management position uh, out of the administrative office, uh, which was funded for last fiscal year, but then ultimately um, not filled and held vacant for the duration of last year and this current fiscal year. So that will also be able to be, um, to be filled. There was a part-time um, administrative position for the Veterans Services Office, which is also um, accounted for in that request that the recommendations will allow us to, to uh, be able to fill on a part-time basis. There's also a request to add hours for the outreach worker in the Elder Affairs at the Elder Services Department, which our recommendation will also allow us to, um, to uh, proceed with funding. Um, there was a request for additional staffing in the Youth Services Department, which um, is, is candidly, you know, potentially going to be a very critical part of the, uh, how we come out of this pandemic. And is an area that might be able to be subsidized by federal funding as part of the pandemic response, but that's unknown at this time. Regardless of the outcome of the federal guidance, that would also be funded in this, um, in the recommendation that's here, because it was what was requested by the department. Um, there was also a request for an increase in the subsidy of the Parks and Recreation Enterprise due to a decrease in revenues in that department um, that you may remember Ms. Stevens identified. And we will be able to fund that for this upcoming fiscal year. It was an, an increase of approximately $54,000 from the annual subsidy. And I don't believe it will be something that we are going to be able to do permanently, but it's something that we're able to do right now to bridge the gap while um, the enterprise gets itself um, back on solid footing and programming um, increases over the coming months. Um, the last thing that I'll identify is we're aware of the concern about whether or not we will receive the youth substance abuse grant um, for future um, fiscal years. And um, we have a very important grant application that's under development and we expect to hear sometime in August whether we get that funding. Um, we are holding an allocation of funding for that program, uh, should that funding not be awarded uh, for the period beginning October 1st when the federal funding will have dried up. Um, um, and we will be um, addressing that and holding that within the salary pool of the fiscal year 2022 operating budget. So uh, that was a quick summary of sort of the big things that were in the budget requests and I'm um, doing it in the interest of time. Um, but uh, I believe you're, what you're, what you saw and what you heard in the request from departments, we are able to meet those requests. And the, real, the only reason we're able to do so is because departments really scale back those requests for, for this current fiscal year. Um, and you know, we, we have a bit of a budget that's, last year was a survival budget because <laughs> we didn't know what to expect. And, and the, the difficult decision that the, this board made, all of its members going back to last spring and, and Mr. Schultz as well, who's not on the board at this point, but was involved in the discussions. They put us in the position to be able to try to continue doing what we're doing and to build back a little bit. Um, and so this budget will do that while we um, try to figure out what the long-term financial prognosis is actually going to be as we come out of the, the pandemic. So I know I've said a lot um, and I know um, a lot at one time, but that's sort of what we tried to do. The finance director, Liz, if you could put that slide up on the screen so folks can attempt to see it. I know it's a lot of, numbers and text, so it's not the prettiest uh, slide to look at, um, but we'll put it up there. But what it basically is going to show you is that we're able to fund the request that you that you saw come in. Um, I, I will note that there was a discussion about, uh, it was not requested, but it, we, it's been highlighted as a need, and that's for fire prevention staffing in the fire department. That is a fairly costly endeavor that we, it was not a request, but it's not something we were able to fund either at this point in time based on, um, just based on the costs associated with it. Um, it's something that we'll continue to look at and, and, and work towards, but we just weren't able to fund it at this point. And again, I can't stress enough. Uh, I know, we know it's a need, but it was not something that was part of the fire department's request, although it was highlighted in their budget presentation. Uh, probably the most significant thing besides the staffing I'd like to just speak to is the small capital. And when we say that, those are very important pieces of equipment that just happen to cost less than $25,000. So we fund them through the operating budget. 
And we have deferred a number of those over the past few years. But because they're one time in nature, because of the availability of free cash, we're gonna be able to do those things, um, which I think is another important step for us. Now I'm gonna stop. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. No, that's a great summary, but let's see if we have any questions. Okay, Mr. O'Leary? Can I just interrupt? Can you see this? Oh, yes. I'm having trouble, okay. I know it's very small, but. Can you do anything to get it to just take over the whole page so we don't have the side slides there? Um, I don't know if you I'm just put a slideshow or. I'm trying, but it's not, um, hold on. If not, I can try on my end. <laughs> that made it small. It, it worked, but it's worse. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe go back to what you had, Liz. There we go. Sort of. Well, we can't see the whole thing. But... No, I'm, I'm trying. Oh. Doesn't let me choose the Zoom, so. Liz, where it says display settings, is there a way to get rid of the notes? Oh my God. Is, is that better? Yes. That's better. Okay. Thank you. It's still small, I know, I'm sorry. Fine. That's okay. So these are all being funded. I like to challenge you guys at this late hour anyway, so. Okay. Normally we're going through a list of cuts and of course that, that's not the case this year. So would you be also able to um, send this to us, Ms. Rook, email us, at least this updated. I don't think, I don't remember seeing it in the packet, but I could be wrong. It was not in the packet, Madam Chair. Yeah. Okay. I, I will make sure it gets added to uh, share file and um, that the transcript and the reporting secretary and the finance committee receive a copy. Okay. So can we, um, let's just see if we, do we have any questions at this point, Mr. O'Leary or comment? Uh, just uh, no. But the, the, the... My first comment is it's it's heartening to see that we're able to uh, restore and even expand some of the services that we consider vital and um, meet some of the requests that the department has made. I guess my, my only question is, what didn't make the cut? <laughs> because uh, an awful lot did, which is which is heartening, and I'm um, I'm assuming that the financial planning team is on board with your recommendations at this point, also. So I again want to echo the, the chair's comments in relation to close working relationship with the school department and the finance committee uh, to get to this point. Fast trucks of the year, three years running, Ram, Ram 2500. Vincenzo, are you gambling while the meeting's going on? <laughs> I'm going to say, kidding. that wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> But anyways, I just didn't know so what didn't make the cut. Um, Adam Chair, through you to the finance director. It's just Ms. Chair. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to uh, select board member O'Leary. Uh, as you can see here, you're not seeing a column with the town administrator's um, recommended budget. So all of the departmental requests um, were funded. So anything that the departments came to you and presented um, have been funded. The, the, the youth services so wanted a, but that, that, was, that was. That was funded. Okay. Oh, it was. All right. I thought that was one of the minus ones. Okay. Addition of the assistance. Uh, oh, directly. that's great. Okay. You just said that. I'm sorry. But Mr. O'Leary, I think um, the I think that the way that the budgets were requested were almost level funding, you know, to sort of ensure that we were able to make it through the make it through successfully financially. So, you know, and also, I think it's been a good exercise uh, annually here the last several years 
for the department heads to evaluate the, the services that they provide, the costs associated with it, and how they go about doing it. And there's been some, some changes as to the approach, and um, which again allows us to, uh, to adapt and be more efficient. But in many instances, we've just been running shorthanded and uh, chasing our tails here. And it's, it's great to see that uh, we're able to uh, bolster uh, the delivery of services uh, that are being required and being requested of us. So I think, it, I think it's wonderful. And I think it's great that we've uh, been able to present us with a balanced budget and still accomplish this. It's, it's quite an accomplishment. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner, questions, comments? No comments, thank you. Mr. Studo? I'm all set, thank you. Mrs. Gonzalez? I I'm just thrilled to see um, some of this, the veteran services person, the elder services, just this is great news for a, a lot of these, um, a lot of people gonna be happy. <laughs> I just said one other question though, just in relation to uh, the library has been requesting position for a number of years and we haven't been able to accommodate that. But do we foresee that at some point, maybe throughout the upcoming fiscal year or is the reason why um, it wasn't? Madam Chair, through you. So there are a handful of, of items that we're gonna be looking at as we go forward with available federal funding. One thing that I mentioned is, you know, the funding of the part-time um, ass assistant um, director for youth services. Again, it's because of its part-time nature, it was a bit more uh, affordable than other positions might be. So we were able to do something, you know, in terms of funding it. But we that may be something that's eligible for federal funding ultimately because of uh, the potential link to the response to the pandemic that it might um, might connect with. Similarly, could be the case with the type of outreach that the library is looking to do with that position. So, you know, that may be one where we see that we can build into a plan funding from the federal um, federal government to try to get that position off the ground. So, it's very much um, uh, in uh, in the discussion. Um, similar, uh, you know, approach with regard to um, our uh, facilities maintenance. Um, you know, there's some things that we're going to need to do as we look to reopen more of the municipal facilities in terms of staffing. Um, maybe not necessarily new positions, but additional hours and coverage that we'll look to do. And that's another area where we think the federal government will be able to, you know, be eligible. We're just looking to get some more guidance on it. But it's very much in the in the discussion, uh, Mr. O'Leary. Okay, thank you. And I think I think we were everyone. Mr. Walner, did you? You're all set. All set. Mr. Tudo's all set. Mrs. Gonzalez, you're all set. All set. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, Ms. Rourke, you do have your, yeah, <laughs> you have your hand raised. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I just wanted to um, pay you back on what the town administrator said and just to um, remind everybody that the library um, did not submit that uh, programmer position for FY22. That was not one of their departmental budget requests. It was discussed during their budget presentation. However, it was not submitted as a request. Uh, similar to the fire department, the fire department discussed uh, during their budget presentation, uh, the fire prevention officer. However, that was not part of their departmental budget request because again, um, this is a, even though it may seem like a hefty budget, it, it's a very slim um, budget departments were very conservative in their their requests um so many departments did not um requ request certain uh positions and um you know some that were positions that were held vacant you know did request to have them restored um so just just I, I wanted everybody to be clear on that it wasn't that the town administrator wasn't funding those positions they just were not requested for FY22 by the department, um, but those are something that we can definitely look at. Okay, thank you, Ms. Mark. Madam Chair. Mr. Gilberto. Finance Director is reminding me of one item that came up, which is the additional cost for the hybrid police cruisers. I believe you are carrying that cost in the recommendation as well. That was not in the original request, but it was a modification that was submitted after the fact based on review of the performance. 
And yeah, could you just speak to that list? Yes. So that is included in the police department's um, uh, miscellaneous capital uh, requests of 118,744, and it was for two cruisers. Um, the quote me needed to be refreshed, I guess, or updated to include them as hybrid vehicles after the discussion at the Saturday budget hearing for the police department. And I, I wanna say it was $6,300 or 6,318 um, in that range. So that has been updated and that is included in, in the figure for the police department miscellaneous capital. So thank you, Mike. Okay. Just, 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 just in relation to it, and again, I'm, I'm sure it happened. I mean, we got some presentations from the department heads in relation to uh, their requests and, and most of them were not uh, a wish list, you know, as, positions that they felt were essential for uh, smooth operations for the uh, various departments. And, and I guess I don't, maybe it's semantics, but when they made their presentation to us, and then you say they, they didn't submit it as a, as a final budget presentation, was it because they were encouraged not to, or didn't, I mean, someone had to prioritize it rather than, we didn't wait, we didn't, we weren't requested as a board to say thumbs up, thumbs down. I mean, we gave some opinions that day when they were there, but then when the final budget presentation, or excuse me, or submissions were made to the administration, I, again, maybe I missed it. I was unaware that um, certain positions were not requested. I was under the assumption that they were requested. And at some point during the budgetary discussions, between the administration and the department heads, things were taken out. Maybe it's semantics, but um, I wasn't aware, and I'm just using the library as an example, that the request wasn't made. I can, because it was made, I mean, it was presented. Well, so through you, Madam Chair, if I may. Yeah, Ms. Burr. The, when the departments submit their budgets to the finance department as well as the town administrator, that position was not requested. It was mentioned in their presentation as they as still like a want, um, but she was the, the library director was not requesting it for FY twenty two. Yeah, and I don't mean to pick on the library. I'm even thinking about you know the, the fire department uh, position that was uh, discussed. I mean, I have some opinions on that too, but. Uh, he did not request it for FY22. Yeah. I, I think the, the question relates more to the guidance. So we did ask all departments to submit level services requests. And we said level services, we said level services back to, you know, basically the day before the pandemic started, if you will. And so a number of things that had been requested along the way were not requested. Uh, Mr. Lear, I'm not sure if maybe that's what you're referring to. Some opt, most did not submit anything. A couple did say, look, this is something that's a need. We're gonna need to submit it anyway. Um, the youth position being one of them. Um, so that that's, I think, where the difference is, is identified. Um, for me, I, I, I just thought, I did it again. Maybe it's just the way that I'm interpreting what's being said. You know, I, I find it hard to believe that what was presented to us were not requests. And then uh, I can understand where things get called out, but, uh, but that's good, I'm fine, let's move on, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so our next order of business is to review the draft warrant June 2021 annual town meeting. For the June, for the June 2021 annual town meeting. Madam Chair, may I share my screen? Sure, that was, that's, that'd be great. Okay. And uh, through you, Madam Chair, um, what, I, what I will do is I'll go through each of the articles if, if you would like, or I can just kind of focus on what's changed from the last meeting. It's really your preference. Sure. Why don't, why don't you just briefly run through each of them in case there's, there are questions and if the members have any questions to, to, you know, just jump in and we'll recognize you. So I, I see the finance director may still be here. Liz, are you still there? Oh, 
Oh, okay. So we'll go through um, each of them. Um, first on the budget amendment, um, I am not aware of anything that's been identified as a need for a transfer at this point in time, but uh, we expect that there will be some adjustments that will have to be made during the June town meeting. And we will um, provide the, the latest and greatest recommendation when the warrant is signed on, um, on May 10th, but uh, it'll likely be evolving right up until the day of the town meeting. The snow and ice deficit, we are expecting to have a deficit beyond what we normally carry over in the fiscal year. We've accounted for that in our financial planning um, and there will be an appropriation of funding that will be uh, recommended there um, at, uh, under that article. I believe it's between 25 and $50,000. Uh, appropriating funds to the capital improvement stabilization fund. We are looking at an appropriation of between 1 million and $1.2 million into that fund, um, the source being free cash. The water uh, stabilization fund, we're normally transferring funds depending upon uh, what's available for retained earnings and we'll make a determination as we get closer to town meeting. Um, the appropriation of money to the stabilization fund, we expect there will be an appropriation um, depending upon the balance of free cash um, from fiscal year 20, uh, the year ending June 30th, 2020. Um, and um, right now, I, I think we're targeting that we expect a surplus of about $300,000 after we go through the financing mechanisms associated with the other items on the warrant. And one thing we've been discussing is allocating some funding to both Article 5 and Article 6 Stabilization Fund and OPEB as a way to sort of build up money we're, we're set, setting aside. Article 7, if there's any funding available at the end of the solid waste year, we usually transfer those funds out of a budget and into the fund. It's unlikely there's going to be much based on the pressure that we know is on the, uh, that budget right now, um, as we've discussed over multiple meetings. Article eight would be a, a, a transfer of funding within this fiscal year to the PFA. We do not expect to recommend a transfer at this point in time based on the performance of the plan. Um, that, that transfer is normally made in the October town meeting and that's what we expect will happen with the, re the uh, remaining funds from FY21's budget. Article nine is routine as is article 10, article 11, and Article 12, Article 13 um, authorizes Chapter 90 money. We expect it to be consistent with, with what it has been over previous years based on a letter from the state. And I think we were at $516,000 off the top of my head. We don't authorize or appropriate the money. We just authorize the ability to spend the money, whatever it is that comes through from the state as required under state law. We know we will have a couple of uh, prior year bills um, that will need to be paid, one of which goes back two fiscal years, but just popped up and we will have a funding source identified. Article 15, we've been talking with town council relative to the receipt reserve fund and uh, for the cell tower, and we are going to be required to request um, special legislation in order to be able to continue um, operating the cell tower revenue source in the way that we have, which is to have the uh, payments come in from the leases and the funding set into a receipt reserve account from which we appropriate funding into the annual operating budget on an annual basis. Um, it is something that other communities do for uh, similar type um, arrangements, but it does require another legislative uh, blessing, which we will be seeking uh, after approval from town meeting. And I know there was a lot of confusion, partially because we had the wrong statutory citation in the, in the legislation to begin in the article to begin with, but it's going to actually be different than what you have in your packet. It's going to need to be an actual request for special legislation in order to do this. Um, but we do not expect it to be an, an, an issue. The operating budget, retirement obligations, the appropriation of the OPEB, those are all routine as part of our annual budget and are accounted for in our financial planning. Transferring funds to the school district reserve fund um, for out of district special education and other costs. We're hoping to be able to recommend a $100,000 transfer. This will be the second $100,000 transfer since the fund was established a couple of years ago. Um, nothing identified yet for rescinding authorizations to borrow, but we'll continue to look at any of the old projects that through which we don't need any borrowing. You will receive a recommendation on May 10th for the fiscal year 2022 capital expenditures. And I know Mrs. Gonzalez and Mrs. Manicelli have been in many of those meetings. Um, we're getting very close. We had a little bit of a hiccup with uh, um, a large project that uh, had been overlooked, but we've um, been able to look further at that and have a bit more time. So we'll be um, being able to address that, um, not for June of this year, but for June of next year. But there will be a complete capital plan Different than what you saw last year, we expect it to be the standard um, comprehensive capital investment um, program with borrowing and free cash uh, appropriations. 
um, presented to you um, on May 10th. Appropriating money to the PFA, um, again, we won't, we're likely not to make an appropriation um, during the June meeting, but we expect to be making an appropriation at the October meeting. We expect to ask for $50,000 for small uh, repairs for town buildings. We are not expecting an appropriation of money for special council legal expenses. We are expecting an appropriation of funding for legal expenses associated with 20 Elm Street. And right now I'm planning to recommend appropriating $100,000 so that we remain in a very strong position relative to this litigation. Article 27, this would amend the code of North Reading, our bylaws to incorporate the school rental revolving fund that was approved, I believe at June town meeting last year. So the uh, account was approved, but we didn't actually approve the change to the bylaw that's required under the statute. And a sister article to that, a corresponding article is to uh, set the dollar amount that's required with that. And I've been in conversation with the school business officer. We believe it's gonna be $125,000 if I remember correctly. Article 28, the finance director is looking um, at all of our various revolving funds just to confirm that the, the caps are the right numbers. And if there are any that need to be modified, we will address them here, but it is possible that we'll pass over this article. We are, if we're confident that we don't need to make any adjustments before the article is signed, we'll actually recommend that the board um, take it off the warrant, but we may not be through the review at that point. And then we're into the, um, the various zoning articles, which we, I think, discussed in, at length, not only earlier this evening, but at the last meeting. Um, which remain on um, the warrant, both for the small cell and for the overlay district of senior housing. Um, and as well, uh, there is, a, as you know, a citizen petition for the rezoning of the former seven acres poultry farm uh, on there. Sorry, there's a, I know this was a marked up copy, so it must have been hard to look at. Um, the citizen's petition is here, along with the change to the zoning map to reflect both um, the citizen's petition and the senior um, housing overlay article. So I think we've really narrowed the scope of what, what we're looking to do with this town meeting. Um, you know, we do have some things on there that are, are not necessarily essential, but I would classify as important and timely. And, um, you know, we've taken the steps to recommend and prepare for an outdoor town meeting with all our appropriate social distancing protections in place to allow us to get through this business in what we hope will be a, you know, a fairly timely fashion. Um, so I know that was a lot, but that's, that's the update. Um, the article relative to the charter change concerning compensation for elected officials, as you know, was discussed at the last meeting. We've taken it off, taken it off based on the board's feedback. Um, just uh, for purposes of our next meeting, this will be finalized for us to- To sign. Right, to sign, okay. And do we have any questions of these articles um, of the members? Mr. O'Leary? None? Mr. Walner? Just one question. I remember last year to kind of expedite things, we put all the budgetary things up front. Does that cell phone revenue, would that be just a real quick uh, item or do you think that's going to be a discussion point? I, where we've been leasing the top towers for, I think, 10 years at this point, I, I, I'm not sure how controversial it is. Um, there is authority for the leases. I don't think that that's in dispute. Um, this is really a housekeeping item more than anything else. So I don't expect okay. it to be controversial. Okay. Uh, we're not asking for authority to put cell towers to, uh, on water towers. They're already there. <laughs> and, and we have the authority from town meeting to have done it. The board got the authority back, I think, in 2011 or 12. So I, okay. I don't expect it to be. Yeah, I just don't want to drag the, you know, drag the, the, you know, the money stuff down in the middle by some controversial thing. If we can race through that to get the zoning ones and everything else that we do. I, I would say um, through you, Madam Chair, the reason we put it there is because if, uh, if it's not the will of town meeting to act in that fashion, as was recommended, we will have a hole in the operating budget that we're gonna to have to deal with when we come to that article. Um, so I, I think it really will benefit us to know the answer, um, whether town meeting is gonna be okay with proceeding in that fashion, and then we'll work with the delegation to get the legislation um, filed. Um, we will have a contingency plan for appropriation if need be, but it would require a change to the operating budget in order to make sure it remains balanced. Okay, thank you. All set, Mr. Walner? Okay. All set, Mr. thank you. Mr. Strudel? All set? Or any questions? Oh, Mr. Strudel's frozen. Mrs. Gonzalez? I'm all set, thank you. Okay. 
Okay, Mr. Can you, can you hear me? I'm all set. We can hear you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. All right. So we are moving. So we'll see that finalized okay, version. Yeah, thank you. All set. We'll see our finalized version at the next, the next meeting. Uh, and then our next order of business is the town administrator's report. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'm uh, pleased to announce that Joseph Parisi has been appointed Director of Public Works effective Wednesday, May 12th. Mr. Parisi brings 19 years of experience as Director of Public Works in Gloucester and Rockport, as well as nine years in the mayor's and assessor's offices in the city of Gloucester. He has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, is a licensed construction supervisor and a Massachusetts certified public purchasing official. We welcome Mr. Parisi um, as uh, he'll be joining us in, uh, in uh, the next few weeks. And we'll have him on an agenda for introduction um, at, either, at one of the main meetings. Based on input from the town planner and feedback from the land utilization committee, I intend to submit the attached draft letter to the Metropolitan Area Planning Council in support of an application of the town of Linfield for technical assistance, evaluating the future use of land that's near the North Reading, Linfield, Middleton and Peabody border. Um, they have a project that they've come up with for a vision for um, the open space in that area. And um, it's something that is very much consistent with the ongoing planning efforts for the, um, the pedestrian trail, the recreational trail that LUC has been working on. There are a number of upcoming recycling events that are scheduled, including curbside collection of yard waste this upcoming Saturday, May 1st. Items should be curbside by 6.30 a.m. Similarly, the curbside collection of scrap metal will be Saturday, May 8th. And there will be a special waste collection day at the DBW yard in the morning of Saturday, June 12th. And I included a detailed flyer, uh, which is posted on the town website. Water main replacement on North Street continues. The contractor has been flushing and testing the main between Main Street and Lowell Road and will be connecting houses in the coming days. Temporary main has been installed on the east side between Main Street and the Moose Tower. Construction will be occurring during the daytime and while the plan is to keep the road open, the public should anticipate significant delays as, it, as it's reduced to one lane or traffic is required to be stopped uh, at various points in time. Um, they have made a lot of progress uh, here there was some discussion about whether um, doing night work was an option, but I think that the feeling was the more appropriate route based on the type of work was to try to get the work done in the daytime as it was originally planned to be done. And then COVID-19 data from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health weekly report showed our risk level as yellow with 14, um, uh, 61 cases over the 14 day period leading up to the test. A percent positivity rate of the 14 day period at 3.53% and a rate of 26.2 per 100,000 residents for a total case count going back to the beginning of pandemic of 1,379 cases. And finally, um, I will note, and I know that there's been some information out there in the transcript as well, um, that the, um, the clerk, town clerk's office is accepting uh, applications for early voting ballots. Applications uh, must be submitted to the town clerk's office by this Wednesday at four o'clock p.m. Um, and then the ballot must be returned to the town hall um, in the ballot box um, uh, out front by seven o'clock on, uh, on Tuesday, May 4th, election day. So I just remind the public uh, of that as well. I know that was a lot, but thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Any questions? Mr. O'Leary? None. Mr. Walner? No. Mr. Studo? Mrs. Gonzalez? Okay, we are on to board member reports. Mr. O'Leary? Just uh, if you recall about a month or so ago, I brought up the issue uh, relating to the biomass plant that was being proposed out in the uh, Palmer Springfield area and asked that we get a report from Reading Municipal Light Department in relation to, first of all, how the contract was signed uh, by Reading Municipal Light and um, the impact that it was going to have and uh, what due diligence was done and how transparent uh, the action was taken. Uh, I was just curious as to if there's been any follow-up on that, but just in relation to that, if you've read in the paper over the last week or two, uh, the big biomass plant that was being proposed out there that uh, Reading Municipal Light was the single largest buyer of uh, signing up to buy from that plant, 
actually did not pass the regulatory muster for good reason and did not get the permits that were required uh, by DEP. Now they may still appeal it, but it was uh, denied for uh, good environmental reasons. And um, again, I would like to understand as a member of the board here, but also as a ratepayer, you know, what Reading Municipal Light is planning on doing in relation to exiting the deal if they can. And uh, what do they plan on doing moving forward in relation to um, engaging in activities and contracts that would uh, be more environmentally uh, sensitive and uh, appropriate, knowing what we know in relation to climate change and also the impact of such plants as, as wood burning plants uh, have on the immediate environment in those communities around Palmer. So I would still like to have some sort of public discussion with Reading Municipal Light as to explaining the rationale for getting into what they got into and now what is their exit strategy if there is one in relation to what they did sign up for. So I still would like a, a follow-up. There's been any other conversation or follow-up in relation to that. Sure. Mr. Just Mr. Earlier, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think Mr. Gilberto wanted to try to speak to that issue. So, thank you, Mr. Mr. O'Leary was kind enough to make me aware of the change of the regulatory status, which I was unaware of. Um, I did not have the opportunity to reach out to RMLD this afternoon, Mr. O'Leary, but I will do so tomorrow um, and advise that we'd like to hear from him directly um, about uh, about what happened um, either at the May 10th or the May um, May 24th board meetings. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the only other matter, Madam Chair, that I'd like to address is um, we have an election to coming up. You and I are both on the ballot, and I expect we're going to be a big draw. We we'll have a huge turnout. Uh, but joking aside, what I would ask the, the general public to do is, is to please come out and, and, and vote. And I understand there are no contested races on the ballot, but you know, for those of us that uh, volunteer our time and services. Um, you know, we spend literally hundreds and hundreds of hours a year. It would be nice if people would just take a little bit of time uh, out of their busy schedules to come out and just express their appreciation by voting. And they just come out anyway. I mean, the, the, the right to vote is, is, is uh, sacred. Uh, the ability to vote is, uh, is sacred. And again, I think it's a fine way of uh, recognition of those that are willing to, to sacrifice and put their name on the ballot and serve the community and to their families for allowing us to do so. And it's just a nice way of doing it. And I understand there's no contested races, so it's not a big draw, but by the same token, we should uh, ask our community members to, uh, to come out and just show their support um, by endorsing the people that are running for office, uh, including my fellow board member, Mrs. Manuel members of the school committee, planning commission, uh, moderator, everybody that's on the ballot, housing authority. It's just important for the public to come out and uh, give some easy recognition for the people that volunteer. So I would urge people to please come out and vote. Um, let's turn the page on, on extremely low turnouts and let's exercise our right and recognize it for what it is, which is a great uh, privilege. So uh, just would ask everybody to please come out and support those that are on the ballot. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Studo. Um, so I'd like to say that uh, Ms. Manny Pelly, Mr. O'Leary, you need to break my record of 253 last year during the, <laughs> the worst COVID stretch. So that's, you know, just no pressure. Good. Anybody listening. Um, so, uh, well, I was going to give an update on EDC, but I think it's very clear what we've been doing there. <laughs> so I don't really have to give that. Um, same with CPC, nothing, um, nothing new. Some more outreach will be given uh, potentially the business owners uh, in the Winter Street, uh, Main Street, possible development. So there's not really any big update there from last time. It's just, again, uh, there's more outreach to the business owners, and we'll see where that leads. Uh, and then I did want to point out, though, though, so there's been, there's been a working group talking about the possible development on Carpenter Drive. And there is a community, um, a Butters were sent a letter a couple of weeks back and tomorrow there is a meeting where any concern to butter, you know, questions like any, um, the, the town is seeking feedback. Um, and I like to say it's very important because there's a town known piece of land and being that it's that it's, uh, you know, it's something where 
the citizens' opinions and concerns are going to be taken seriously because, again, it's not a private developer who owns the land. It's the town. So that's something that, you know, if there's any improvements, ideas, something, I know that um, I've learned a lot about that pro that parcel of land that it's been, I think now we're going on eight years in the making. It might be, you know, maybe even longer, but, you know, I understand that. So uh, I encourage everyone who has an opinion on it or wants to give a, an opinion, positive or negative, hopefully mostly positive, you know, from uh, uh, to please join. And I believe that the uh, the Zoom information, uh, a CPC meeting was uh, posted for that because I think there's going to be more than two members. So just in case there was a quorum, you know, because of the quorum rules. So I think you just have to go to the town calendar and there's a Zoom link. And I believe the start time is seven based on the calendar. Tomorrow uh, evening, 7 p.m. public hearing. Tomorrow evening. Uh, and, uh, yeah, a lot so. of information on the web town's website with regard to a few design proposals for senior housing on Carpenter Drive on the land that the town owns, which is the roadway in and two rather large parcels um, connected by that roadway. And um, there, there, there are design plans, Mr. Gilberto, right, that are proposed on the, on the website. You're muted, but they're, they're, they're seeking public input with respect to those few design proposals that were presented. And this, this parcel has been earmarked for quite some time now for, for senior housing. Um, Correct. And it was initially the subject of grant, a grant uh, funded proposal that's going back quite a few years so right mr gilberto that's correct yes it was um to be funded through a federal grant program that i believe mystic valley elder services was going to take advantage of the property i think was transferred from the care custody and control of the school committee to the select board or board of selectmen at the time um, at town meeting for purposes of development for affordable housing for seniors the funding dried up it's kind of sat there undeveloped at this point in time and the CPC, I think over the past two years with the board's um, cooperation and encouragement has re-energized or restarted the review of what might be feasible on that property. And so there are some concepts that the uh, engineers have come up with based upon the site, the ability to locate uh, wastewater treatment on site um, that I know that they will review. But as Mr. Sudo indicated, I mean, the meeting is really a very important part of just getting some feedback from the neighborhood about what might or might not work in the neighborhood because it's going to be a very important part of the decision making i'm sure for all of us and the last point i'd like to make to our fellow board members that this uh purposely uh the working group wanted this meeting first and then it comes to us so we would have kind of not just the opinion of you know a group of people which is very well represented by everyone you know cpc five so everyone people know um but then the next step would be to come for the first series of discussions in front of us to kind of you know kind of give i i, I think that a butter feedback was going to be very important because you know i mean if they had come to us before that meeting it would have been like well, what do the people think right I, it would have been one of the first questions we asked because that's what we always ask that's what we're kind of i feel like that's our one of our primary things so so yeah, um, you know the, the the TA is going to be kind enough to attend, uh, which I think will help. Just because I I believe Mr. Pierce will be given the presentation, but I think that um, you know because we, in reality, my understanding is that for our purposes, we don't even have enough information to even give an opinion yet as a board because we're just there's not enough. As it's conceptual and in, in theory only. So I think it'll be a really nice. I I, I think we'll get a really nice uh, idea of where the community's at tomorrow. I'm not sure it's the first of many meetings. So, and other than that, um, I'll probably mention it a few times, but when when that EDC event goes through, hopefully safely, as Mr. Wallner mentioned, uh, it'd be really nice if everybody on this board showed up and made me look good that I, at least I could get my board to this community event. So I'm just gonna, you know, I'm probably gonna repeat it a few times, but I'll ask now and I'll ask every week that we have a meeting until then, so. That's my little uh, 
ask and I'll buy everybody a drink with my own money. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Studo. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Walner? Yeah, I look forward to the invite. It's always fun <laughs> to get together. <laughs> I'll, I'll pass him a drink though, so you'll be all set. Um, uh, just that uh, for community notice, uh, Carl, Car Cars Hallmark is closing this Friday. So if you haven't gone down to say goodbye to Mary Ellen and Karen, try to get down there. I don't know how much inventory is left because my wife, I think, bought out most of the store. So <laughs> We have my cards coming out of our ears and a bunch of things. So, anyways, try to get down there if you can and uh, say goodbye to them. Um, the uh, tax committee actually met today to uh, meet with food, uh, the food pantry because they actually turn out to be a significant face for people who need uh, help. And so, we're trying to, just as a reminder, we're trying to, as a tax committee, um, you know, there's there's a part of the tax committee that reaches out to people that are are not in a good way, and it helps to reach out and offer them programs that helps them um, get through tough times. And so we're trying to uh, um, create uh, synergistic resources uh, for people to reach out to. And it turns out the food pantry, as we learned today, was a great great example of someone who's forward facing with people. And uh, we may want to work with them to figure out our program. So much more to come on that. And then um, Phil Hertz, who's leading the bike trail um, initiative, I think is pulling wheelies uh, with the release of that letter um, in his neighborhood, you know, for the, uh, the getting the um, towns, getting us a letter out, the MAPC saying we want to join with Winfield, Peabody, and Middleton in, uh, you know, helping to make this uh, bike path happen. Uh, we should realize that you know the cost of the spike path was possibly around eight million dollars, but without the um, and the vast DOT will pick up almost all of it, but without them agreeing to the to their very strict conditions, we don't have any way to get that funding. This this letter and this effort, having a community uh, town cooperation, goes a long ways to mass DOT saying yes to our project. So. There's a lot, a lot of other hurdles, but this is really great news on, in, in the uh, evolution of this project. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez, anything? Yeah, um, I would also like to encourage everyone to go down to cars. Um, I went down and said my goodbyes this week and also stocked up on my cards and gifts and, um, you know, really sad, you know, just, been bringing the kids in there every Christmas to pick out their hallmark ornaments. I mean, they're all grown now, but um, you know, just a lot of memories there and, and it's sad to see them go. So yeah, help them out, you know, try to clear out that inventory for them. Um, uh, community impact team had a um, bring your used drugs. I can't think of that. I'm so tired. <laughs> I can't think of the actual name of that, one, Mr. Gilbert. Prescription drug take back. Thank you. <laughs> um, they collected over 220 pounds of unused drugs on April 24th, which was fantastic. So, um, yeah, that was a, it. Was a great turnout. Um, and uh, as far as recycling, we, um, Mr. Gilberto, covered. A lot of that and um, just on a side note we are going forward with talks to continue talking about pay as you throw um, what a lot of people don't realize is just because we signed the trash contract does not mean that we cannot implement pay as you throw going forward it can be a separate issue um, and it can be different than we've had it in the past there are lots of options um, basically, yeah, for an example of, you know, paying your regular trash fee and then anything extra you want to put out, you put a sticker on. So it doesn't put people out to have to run out and get stickers just for their regular trash. Um, it would just be, um, extra money coming in for the extra trash. So just ideas like that going forward with recycling, um, committee to talk about those things. And that would be it. Uh, thank, I appreciate that because I think I think Mr. O'Leary mentioned and I was going to ask that we did get a pretty detailed letter from Mr. Lohr with regard to the those 
sort of things that the, the trash fee is going towards that, you know, he raise, raises the issue of, um, you know, it's not just the increase in the, in the um, cost of the contract. So I think it would help even if the, if the committee were to outline that as well as the work the committee did to kind of compare what we do to other communities and the, you know, the cost factor or the cost differential or the cost savings between us and other communities and what they're doing. And, 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 and when you do consider and evaluate the pay as you throw, consider the communities that that utilize it and had to scrap it and move on to something different because it just didn't didn't work or meet the needs of the community. So, or well that it did work and they're still using it. So um, that would be help, I think, to us as we evaluate because I think we should just keep keep on the path that we're on, which is a, a massive increase all at once. And just if we need to buffer to increase to cover cover the costs we should know all these details and have all this information ready. So um, I was wondering what, what we were gonna be doing to kind of respond to the information that he's presented and asking us to. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're discussing maybe having kind of a public um, meeting, you know, to let people come on and discuss and, you know, um, that kind of a thing. There's a lot to talk about and there's a lot of options we can think about going forward. Okay, that's great. Okay, that sounds good. And we're, so just, I'm all said, I think everything that needs to be said was said. And so do we have a motion to adjourn? You don't want to drag it out till 10 o'clock? Oh, no. <laughs> I just I just peeked at the time. And I thought, <laughs> if we're going to keep Allison around, we better start. I'll second that. Mo motion to adjourn by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. And Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. All Thank right. you, everybody. Have a good